I think I did it. I've noticed this second camera I have just like hates my hates my life. Um, like look how dark I am. But on my cam on my like streaming camera, yeah, I'm like I'm almost overexposed at this point with how much light I have. You look like a sexy vampire or like a sexy witch. Nice. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely different. like a lot. And then compared on my screen, at least, like I look like bright and white. But truly, I think yeah. if our personalities were honest, I'm probably like darker inside and more like mischievous. And you're probably like all light and Jesus like. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> but our streams make it look like the opposite. It's perfect. I have a meaner bone. And I think I have a meaner bone in my body though than you do. What? No, you think? You don't think so? I, I mean, so. maybe. I mean. Gosh, I mean, I'll take it, girl. I can, I will take any positive like towards my reputation of not being a bitch like i'll take it <laughs> you can have it girl you can have it okay okay i don't want it i just uh I, sometimes i get mad you know and, i mean uh, it's passion i see it as passion really it is passion i do i do get very very angry because i like care about things a lot but uh and i try not to be vitriolic like i don't make petty that's not true i'm sometimes petty i think you can't be mature if you're not willing to be a little bit petty sometimes. okay wait did you see the andrew tate greta whatever her name is thornburg or whatever <laughs> like is that not petty is that not, that not them just jerking off their audiences and being like look at me yeah. go after this 19 year old look at me go after this bald man and i'm like what is happening yeah. Yeah, how is this real was. life and then all these adults being like yes greta yes and i'm like what? What is this petty energy we're sending to the universe? Like, no wonder God is going to punish us and the end times are coming. I'm not even religious, but honestly, she has the right to destroy us. <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> Anyways. Okay, guys, I'm going to look at the chat for just a few seconds while we're talking. Just, like, tell me how the – you guys keep saying the volume is good, but I just – I want to make sure because I'm hitting the red on my end. Like, mine says I'm in the red, so I'm just going to lower me down you're a little bit. You're great on my side. Am yeah, I? Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. I just want to make sure. Let me know if I really am in the red. Otherwise, you get to tell us why we're here today. Hello. Yes. Okay. So I wanted to talk to you about, um, actually, me being mean is kind of part of it. So um, I, how do I simplify this for the audience? You've been in the space for 12, 13 now? Are you 13 I, don't, I don't know the exact years, but I'm 33 and I started at like 18, 19 out of high school. Okay, so like more than a decade. We'll yeah. just go yeah. with that. Um, and that means you've been like through the ups and downs and you have borderline. So you've like dealt with the ups and downs of social. I can't even imagine having borderline and doing toxicity. <laughs> Bro, abandonment I issues can't imagine. in the internet. I, Perfect combination. <laughs> yeah, truly, truly. In the worst, the, the worst of, of sisters. <laughs> um, but when I took a week off, uh, I did it for my IBS because uh, mm. my like uh, health issues are flaring up. Yeah. Mind you, they're still actually pretty bad. I just, mm. my stress levels have come down. So I think that they're more manageable now. Whereas okay. like they were just like taking me out, but I'm still like yeah. sleeping for a really long, like I need like 10 hours of sleep again. <sighs> yeah. I'm still losing weight, which is why I ate boring. I'm going to try Carno again for three weeks. Cause the last time I did Carno, it like corrected my health and I like could function again, mm -hmm. but I've lost like, I've lost like five pounds and I'm eating constantly. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, which I know a lot of people hear that and they're like, oh, poor you. But it's like, it's it's not that I'm sad that I'm losing weight. It's that I'm like, I know what that means about For the health. reason why. <laughs> yeah. The reason why. Yeah. 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 So in my week off, one person reached out to me and they basically said like, hey, I really understand like needing time to take time off and stuff. You know, I noticed like the reason I left the space was because not because of what the space did to me in and of itself, because I figured out a way to function but I hated who I was becoming in this space, mm. which like, I don't know what they meant. I'm, I'm going to totally project myself onto them, obviously. But I read that as like, I didn't like that I became like harder, meaner, and like less trusting of others and like more resentful of the world. Sure. Um, which is something that I've noticed. And everyone commented on that when I first came into this space of being like, I wonder how long it's going to take before she's like bitter and angry and hates everyone. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And I, I think I had enough wisdom even back then to be like, who knows? Like, I'm not sure. Hopefully it doesn't happen, but it probably will. Yeah. Um, and I see this happen so often, right? Because the internet space is so toxic um, and so nasty and mean. Um, and there's really good things that come out of it too. That I guess my first question to you is, how did you manage to go through, especially as a borderline person, going through the internet and social media and not become embittered? Because I don't really see you as embittered toward any group. Um, whereas I think most people become embittered toward one <clears throat> side or another, whatever their yeah. out group is. 
Um, well, to be honest, and for the viewers who've been with me for a really long time, um, you would have seen Bitter Britney. <laughs> so I think like the most bitter I ever was was when I used to run a show called Thoughts for Thoughts. And like, I was really proud of that. And I thought that was so like catchy. Yeah, Thoughts like I thought that was so right. catchy. And I was like really in my like sex positive, like, you know, Am uh, what's that girl, Amber Rose, who does like the slut walk phase. I was like really in my um, fuck men, like I'll drink your tears, use it for lube phase. And so like, I was just really angry at everybody. <laughs> and I was angry because I didn't feel like I was being heard. And then uh, everywhere I went, I realized I wasn't being heard and I wasn't being heard and I wasn't being heard and then I realized like oh maybe I'm the problem maybe um the way I'm expecting society to hear me is the problem and then I got therapy and I got diagnosed with borderline and then I went through this journey of like radical acceptance like Dr. Michelle and Hanoi says and I became a person who instead of seeing what the world owed me I was like what can I do for the world and not in the savior complex that I definitely had at the time but in a um because the savior complex made me bitter as well. I'm trying to help you. Why aren't you letting me help you? How dare you not let me help you? And then I realized, oh, I'm not accepting these people for who they are, nor am I accepting that they might not want my help. Right. And gr being raised religious, where I was told, like, you know, be a, be a voice for Christ when I was a feminist and I was told be a voice for women when I was this and this and this. And th I was always told, like, be a voice. And so when I went through my stalker situation and my ex-boyfriend and everything was a mess. I left the internet for like six months and just did Patreon. Right. And I was living on a farm and I was building fences with my brother at like 6 a.m. in the morning. <laughs> and I'm weak. So that was like a lot of work for me. The most I've ever done in my whole life, really. Like digging rocks out of just layers of ground. And I sat there, I'm like, this sucks. Like this is the, whole this sucks. Whoever does this for a living, like you are amazing because this sucks. And uh, my brothers were going to teach me how to CNC and they were trying to get me out of YouTube and they're like, get off the internet. You know, Kiwi Farms was destroying my mental health at the time. <laughs> okay. And um, I didn't know why all my communities were turning on me over a rumor from a stalker. Like, I just didn't understand why women were doing this to me, doing it to me. But mm -hmm. what they were doing was they were afraid that they didn't know how to judge someone, me, and they were afraid that they had judged me incorrectly. And because I was around a bunch of weak people who didn't have a sense of character themselves, they couldn't see mine. Mm. So I became less bitter at the world because now I see everyone as someone I could take care of, but also only the people who actually are ready for it. So I think I am more in a mother role and I think mothers shouldn't be bitter over their children's actions. Right. Right. Okay. That's interesting. It's an interesting self journey. The problem is it's not necessarily replicable for most streamers because I don't think most streamers want to or should be. Yeah. 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 I'm not looking uh, to make friends anymore. I'm not looking to find a group anymore. I'm not looking for a community. I'm looking for individuals who want to cross moments with me and then never show up in my life again. I am looking right. for I um I'm definitely like one of those like I'm on an island. I want to use the internet to observe the world, talk to the world, and then I want us to go away. <laughs> but I think most streamers and my past self, I tried to form friend groups. I wanted to find girlfriends. I wanted to be in a clique. I wanted to have a YouTube friend group. Now I would say my YouTube friend group is like you and Abba and Steven. And that's really dope and I like that and that's really cool. Mm -hmm. But we're also all pretty individualistic and come together. Yeah. Like, ABBA doesn't live on the same part of YouTube Steven does. It's just ABBA happens to hop into Steven's universe. Do you know right. what I mean? Like, the people yeah. who, you know, it's not the same communities. The people who watch me don't traditionally watch Steven or ABBA either. But I think there's probably going to be more overlap with my audience and yours moving forward. But in general, that's the, the coolness of this situation is that all of my friends who I like are all independent souls. And mm -hmm. no one's going to feel too hurt if we don't become best friends. Right. You yeah. know. Mm -hmm. What about you, though? Like, why do you find yourself being bitter right now? Um, I think I go through phases of it. Mm -hmm. I mostly feel like I notice the glean of it popping up. So I don't <clears> think <throat> I feel bitter toward any group specifically right now. Mm. Um, the issue is I noticed, and it's super hard to disentangle what's what's psychological for me and what's physical health. Cause around the mm. same time that my health has nosedived, my fuse has been way shorter with people yeah. and I'm more quick to be like really hard on them and be like, like shut the fuck up. You're stupid and dumb them. Right. Totally. And get, like, kind of mean at them. Relatable. And it's, and so it's like, the problem is 
it might be just my physical health making me a shorter fuse, but I'm still responsible for it. And if I don't feel like, because like one of my number one goals for myself is uh, I told myself when Nick and I were separated as well, mm-hmm. all I wanted, I got to a place in, point in the separation where I said, all I want to do is that the, wherever the separation ends up, I want to look back and be proud of myself for how I conducted it. Yeah. I want to be able to know that I had compassion for somebody that I had loved for years, even if we ended up separated. Yeah. Um, that I had treated him well, that I'd been fair to my own ethics, that I'd followed my own principles, that I hadn't just like done things that would have been nice for me, but fucked him over in a big way that in any other world I would say is like the wrong thing to do. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And so I think a large part, it's like when I'm getting more shorter fused on people, it doesn't feel like I'm at my best and I'm most proud of myself when I'm at my best. Not because I'm perfect at my best, but because my best is essentially the part, the the shape of me that I'm most proud of. Um, and so I think what happens is, I think it's very easy to internalize shame and, and turn it into X word blame, right? Mm-hmm. So like, I think that's where the bitterness comes from for people where people really mean and nasty and misread them and call them a bunch of names. And there's a part of them that probably feels like it's a little true. Yeah. Or like there's something to criticize there. Because there's something to criticize about everyone. We're not perfect. Right. And then they feel internal shame for a while. But a lot of times the internet criticisms are not very good. Like they'll be right. like, you're a you're a pick me. You're a label. And it's like, well, you're not really. Like you're not really. There's some things they're doing wrong here, but you're not really that label. So right. then you realize that they're wrong about the criticisms, but you still feel a little insecure because you know there's probably some criticism mm-hmm. that's warranted. And now you're mad. How dare they put that label on you? And so it turns into like external blame on the other person. And so I noticed myself going into like the lope of like self-blame, of like self-loathing popping up and disliking myself. And that's, I I think I've done enough self-work to catch myself there. And I haven't shifted into the blame of others, but um, it's hard not to. And I would like to catch it even soon. I don't want to cycle down into the self-blame. Yeah. Okay. Three things came to mind. Let's see if I remember which ones they were. So (laughs) I feel like Neville Longbottom. No, that's okay. I can't remember what I forgot. So the first one is uh, a caller said this to me and I was just really profound in a moment in my life where I really needed to hear it. So my callers also give me wisdom all the time and I'm so grateful for it. But they said like, I don't want to be on my deathbed and really have regretted something. And I was going through something with some people and I was really frustrated by it. And so I realized if I didn't give them an olive branch, if I didn't at least do the work on my end, even if they rejected it, I would regret it because Mm. the truest part of me wants them to humanize me and me humanize them enough to get along. But my petty self, my bratty self, hoo-hoo, girl, I am a physically uh, expressive person. So, like, I'll call my partner and be like, I need to vent. And he loves Britney's venting sessions where I just, like, sit there and yell and bang things on my desk because I'm like, why are they doing this? Why are they doing this? Like, don't they know? Like, haven't I given them enough? Haven't I given the internet enough of me over the decade for them to know I'm not a fucking bad person? Like, what the fuck else do I have to, right? I'm like angry. I'm expre- I'm like vomiting all my emotions onto them. I'm like, thank you. And then I go to them. I'm like, hi, guys. So I really meditated on this. And this is what I feel like. Because now all that anger I had, that that feeling of rejection I'm feeling because I'm not being seen is now out in the universe. It's not onto my partner because he just sees it and goes, huh, OK, <laughs> and just like rolls it off his body. So I'm not putting it on him. But it allows me to like really try to meet people where they're at. But also remember that they can't see me because I also don't allow people to see me. As much Mm. as I'd like to pretend that I'm on the internet and I'm an open person, I deliberately curate the version of Britney that I'm comfortable with the public seeing. Right. And so, which most people do. And of course, they're going to get shit wrong. Of course, they're going to assume the worst. If I have bubble language and we all disagree, like about what it means, of course. Now, the the bubble also helps me um, disconnect my feelings from people. So like, I don't live in most people's bubbles. I live in my bubble. I curated it. I exist in it. The way Mm -hmm. I see the world is not the way most people see the world because how could it be when all of us are so different? Right. And I'm not saying I'm the only one who thinks this way, but I pretty right. If your consciousness like doesn't belong, I don't belong to a group. I'm not religious. I don't belong to any like specific groups. I don't adhere to any particular philosophy. I'm just like a eclectic collector of things and ideas. So truly I'm dealing with whatever I think. So, of course, it's going to be hard to find people that can meet my in my bubble. So I have to hop into theirs. But every time I hop into theirs, they start building a version of Britney in their head that, of course, complements their belief systems. So then when they meet a version of me, like a family friend the other day was like, wait, you don't believe in God? I was like, bro, I haven't believed in God since I was like 19. But since she never bothered to ask and since I never bothered to 
tell her until tell recently, her. the assumption was I am like her, not that she is like me. Right. And so instead of getting bitter at the fact that people don't see me, I have to just grow up and accept the fact that I probably don't want people to see me. Yeah. That I just want them to humanize the version that I do show them, but they can't because I think the audience feels for me that I'm keeping something from them. And so they assume it's malicious. Oh, she must be mm -hmm. like being like mischievous and malicious behind clothes. But really all I'm trying to do is not cry on the internet every time I want to fucking self-harm. Because yeah. they don't understand me, right? But who is going to understand me really? And why do they think they should? Right. Interesting. Yeah, I think I get stuck in this paradigm because I, I can understand how you've made peace with it. Mm. The problem is I think that my goals are different. And the yeah. problem is if my goals are different, there's certain things that I can't just let go, right? Like I, I think when we talked even yesterday, like there's this, there's, there's lines sometimes where like when people cross that, there's something in me that says somebody needs to stand up against this. Mm. Somebody must, right? And it makes me think of like, if we turn it into like the proverbial, like the, the, the kid getting bullied on the thing, it's like somebody should stand up. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily have to be you. Like right. I would never put this on anyone else. I don't think you have to. I, like I wouldn't say Brittany has to do what I'm doing in the world. I'm very like my orientation is different, but I'm the type of person that like, I want to be the person standing up and saying like to the bully, like enough, enough is enough. Like stop kicking them. Yeah. Um, that's just, that's just my front election, my personality. And it always has been. And I think to like, not to do that would just, I would have to like, sh hollow myself out a little bit because it's such a like core tenet of myself maybe or maybe i'm making this shit up just because i really like this part of myself i'm not really sure what do you get from it i don't know it just feels like uh, it's like breathing it's like, like joy guess, nope hmm. it's it's more like i can't not like I can't watch a kid getting kicked and nobody stand up for him and not say something i can't like stand in the way and be like enough enough is i enough. think i, I would just, stop them because yeah. i think it's annoying i'm like hey you're being freaking annoying why would you do it though like what my mind would be like hey you're being annoying you can kick the like shit out of this kid later but right now you're pissing me off and this kid hey you need to learn how to defend yourself but for you you sound like you're like it's a justice thing it is a justice thing like it's it's like an itch i can't i can't not scratch like mm. i i don't get much from it it's usually unpleasant I feel distressed during the process hmm. the whole time I'm questioning, like, cause I'm aware, like if I have a justice bent, who the fuck am I to say that I know what justice is? Yeah. So as I'm going in to defend the proverbial kid getting kicked the whole time, I'm like, what if this kick just killed the other guy? Like, what if this kid just killed the other guy's like brother? Like mm -hmm. maybe I'm on the wrong fucking side. So like, I'm aware of all of these pieces, but I can't not. And I've like learned, I've learned to have wisdom because like my justice party wants to jump in right away. I just solve it. And I've learned enough times that I've been, I've been wrong enough times about like which side was really in the wrong uh, because I didn't get enough of the information that I'm slower to jump in now. Like I try to like ask questions and figure out what's going on and the world is complex. Right. But once I've like teased apart as much as possible and I think I have a good understanding of what's going on, I don't know how to not stand in. It's, it's probably, it's probably literally just my stuff. Like, um, no one ever defended me ever because I was the perfect golden child. Yeah. And so like my dad was like, yeah, kind of like bordering on abusive at times. And my mom was so exhausted and, and tapped out mm. that it's like, if, if my dad was being really aggressive towards my brother, for example, I was the one stepping in. Like I was the one putting my body physically between like my brother and him. Yeah. Uh, and my mom would be like upstairs sleeping or just like watching TV because she was like so emotionally like checked out. But nobody did the same for me, like ever growing up my entire life. So like, maybe that's it. I'm just like, I'm like rescuing Kyla for myself. I'm not sure, but like, it's just this insatiable itch. And I feel like even if I work past that part of me that feels the need to do that, I'm not sure the desire to like protect others would go away. It's interesting. Um, Cause like it, there's a, uh, you, got, you know, my like core word for myself is like mother. And I feel like mm -hmm. my desire, but the kind of mother that I aspire to be and the kind of mom that I think I am in spirit is not a mom that like constantly like defends the weak because I think the right. weak should be stronger. And I think they get stronger by facing the strong. Mm -hmm. But I also want to make sure that the strong isn't going to accidentally kill someone in the process. Right. So right. I think it's a, like I'm more of a you, I feel like yours might be instinctually moving and mine is more of a wait and watch and see when I should intervene because I still think it should happen. 
Mm-hmm. But it's a matter of when do I get to intervene because now the smaller person just can't defend themselves. So I have to come in and be like, hey, now we've crossed the line. They're not ready. So they need training and they need help. But often I feel like I'm more of a, um, yeah, I, I, I feel like I'm hearing like um, older sister energy or like the need to like, you know what I'm saying? Like there's a specific energy you're throwing out there that is like, um, I don't know what it is. What is it called? Like you're like you're being pulled. Like, I cannot not do it versus right. I'm just like, I'll see something. I'm like, should I intervene? And then I'll wait and think about it. Mm-hmm. Why don't you yeah. think about it first? I do now. Oh, okay. I've learned to, I, so I have learned to temper it. So that okay. was definitely my predilection, uh, but it's backfired enough times. Mm, um, totally. And I think like, you know, when I was like 19, I got hit with a hard lesson that like sometimes if you go too beyond, like sometimes the worst harm you could do to somebody is doing all the labor for them because then they that's never what it is, girl. It. That's and what it I is. I learned. Yeah. And I learned that at 19 very hard. Like I had a very hard lesson in that. And I don't cross that line anymore because I like, I literally look at like this one person's life and I'm like, I think I fucked up really yeah. hard in yeah. loving this person. It was with good intentions, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Like, I was wrong. I overstepped. So I'm, I rein that in really hard now. I'm very slow and very careful about like not enabling or like taking away lessons that people can learn on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess there's this two thing. There's one is like the kid who needs, who's getting kicked and bullied. But sometimes I'm concerned that like the kid isn't getting kicked and bullied and needs to like learn how to like stand up for himself. Sometimes I'm worried that there's like a coyote in the middle of the night coming to steal your kids. And it's totally. like, you don't, you don't reason with the coyote. There's no like, which side It's just like, this is not okay. And I'm going to protect. Um, yeah. I think yeah. there's that part of me as well. Curious. I'm running through this dilemma and maybe you can help me like get it so I got like I'll get emails all the time from different kinds of people and I depending on the email will not even respond for a call Mm -hmm. because sometimes Mm -hmm. I'll get I got this weirdest email like a while ago and I was like what is this and it was like hey Brittany I only have like x amount of dollars in my account that doesn't equal to your call thing but I'm willing to spend it on you because I really want to help you with your health stuff and I was just like What what is this? And then I'll get yeah. some emails from people who are like, "Hey, I'm going through X, and I know I should go to a therapist, but I thought I hit you up." And I'm like, "You've already admitted you need a therapist. Why are you emailing yeah. me?" And I'm a, right. I consider myself a luxury item. I am a privileged item. I am for the privileged to have either saved up or slashed have extra cash laying around. I am not a priority reach out. You know what I mean? Unless you're looking Mm -hmm. for literal like, hey, I'm having an existential crisis. I've already done therapy. I've done the gym. I've done the priest. I've done this. I'm looking for something else. Well, then I'm your girl, right? Let's talk about philosophy. Let's talk about what does it mean to be a person, right? But I, I sometimes run into this thing where I get I get so angry at people for being so useless in relation to helping themselves. I almost want to be like, I'm going to take your money from you. And you're so lucky I don't. But like, I almost want to punish them for being so irresponsible with their own safety and money that I almost want them to be hurt a little bit. And so that's the part of my bitterness that I think I actually have towards people, which is like, Mm -hmm. I almost resent them. Like even listening to the Andrew Tate, this is a very like toxic thought, FYI, toxic thought, toxic thought. But sometimes I think the women who fall for Andrew Tate deserve it. Because I'm just like, are you fucking stupid? Look at his videos. He's all over the internet. He's the most Googled man. Do the math. But then these girls just go like, but what if, what if I'm the one? I'm the special one. And I'm just like, I'm going to kill myself. I'm going to unalive myself right now. But that's, that's the part of me that's like so ugly that when I think about these people, I'm like, you're basically asking for it. Like not to victim blame, but like, hello, ma'am. And then at the same, like, that's the frustration I think. That comes out when you're a YouTuber, at least a content creator, you get to be exposed to a lot of different people. And so Mm -hmm. it can make you bitter. But instead, I what I do is I express my emotion because it's real. It's like a real chemical reaction I'm having. But then I place it where it belongs, which is in like bitter Britney shelf. And I remind myself that this is my bitter thought. And this isn't my like human thought. This isn't my like five thought or this isn't my peaceful thought. This is a thought I have because I'm actually fucking worried for them. And I wish I could protect them all. And I wish I could tell them exactly what to do. And I wish I could coddle them and hold their hands. But but I can't. Mm -hmm. And I think that is what I've had to learn how to balance out, especially as like a mom character. Like I sometimes this is such a bad thing to do. Sometimes I'll go on like adoption websites and I'll read kid bios and I'm like, oh, my God, I want to adopt them all. And I'm like, I just want to take them all. But who are these 500,000 kids in foster care in the U.S.? There are kids who have been forced into existence and then abandoned by their parents or their parents can't take care of them. Yeah. And so now I'm mad at the parents for even having those babies. Mm -hmm. And then I'm mad at this and I'm mad at this and I'm, 
you can only be so mad before you just have to do something about it and do what you can within your spoon limit. Yeah. You know what I mean? But like, I think that bitterness is normal and natural. I just think you shouldn't make it the pri- like your your personality. <laughs> right. And I think that's that's what's interesting is it seems like for so many people, especially like anyone who deals with controversial topics, like bitterness becomes comes the forefront, right? Like, yeah. um, like I think it's important to say like there's like what you said, like like you said, the toxic thought. Like this is the top thought that you disavow of being like this isn't this isn't really what I think. This right. is a visceral reaction because I'm upset. Right. Because I'm really worried because I'm right. like, holy shit, there might be like trafficking going on. Like these, like fuck that, like fuck the world's yeah. fucked up. Yeah, exactly. Um, the problem is that like the problem is when you get rewarded for the bitterness, right? Mm-hmm. With the anger that makes it much more addicting. And bitterness allows you to it allows you to project away from yourself. Yeah. Um, so it's extremely comforting. And so um I think that's the thing that I try to be really like careful of because I think I think bitterness is a predilection that I have. Probably because I'm human. I don't know if that makes me special. I think that's most people. But I don't I don't want my worldview to be informed by my bitterness. Right. Um, which it feels like so many people in this space become that way, where it's like, I have an experience, I get upset by it, and now my political opinion matches what would have either resolved that or makes like my experience have an easy bad guy. And it's like, I don't I don't want to be that because I don't I don't think that that's like wise essentially yeah um i just don't know how to catch the bitterness in like such a toxic space um and i think i've mostly come to come to a solution at least for now it probably won't fix it for all all of time but like with the like manosphere black pill types i think i've i think i figured it out mm-hmm. uh, and i don't really find them disdainful anymore I, when like i'd say three weeks ago i, I found them p- quite disdainful yeah um which unfortunately the solution is to say like yeah i do have better emotional faculties i like i i actually am coming from a place of like uh greater empowerment and so like the call is higher responsibility on me Mm. i I should be i should be even more patient yeah um and to like be good to these people i also have to call out the really bad behavior i do have to point out when like their thinking is really stupid um so it's like it's annoying because the solution is to ironically enough condescend at them more mm. it's just condescend at them in a way that they like it um, yeah 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 which is annoying so like and, and in the process everyone's calling me so condescending and i like realized like along the process of being like wait that's li- like fuck I, you're saying i basically have to do more of it i have to actually i have to actually be condescending it's just in a way that they aesthetically will like it um which i don't like uh because i was trying to treat them like equals and like um punching straight but, yeah, yeah yeah well i will say um as okay the when i was really sick in creating content um <clears throat> i had a really sick audience mm. and then as i got healthier my audience got healthier and then even as i got healthier there were still people like um who weren't so healthy who still followed me and that's normal and that's okay we all have moments right no biggie but i noticed that i upset people because I don't fit into the brand that they want me to be. Like the other day, and please, if this person is listening, like I love you so much, you're not fucking taking it personal. But like I got this um, suggestion from one of my callers who was like, hey, your last podcast felt more like a reaction video. And I was like, yeah, I'm fucking sick and I have chronic illness and the thing I had planned didn't work out. So I asked my brother to emergency help me make a podcast, which was a reaction video. Thanks for fucking me, make, me, making me feel worse. <laughs> like they just like what they're thinking is i didn't get what i wanted so i'm gonna express it to you yeah but i just explained to them like i know i'm a beautiful strong independent woman but i'm a chronically sick human who pretends i'm tougher than i am so i can get my work done like most people in america like most people around the world Mm -hmm. i am not special i am like all of you who still go to work when we're sick and go to work when we have cramps and go to work when we're like chronically ill okay i'm not any different youtubers are not any different but they forget that. And I think because we have like a job where we work from home, we must be able to always be like perfect. And that like I have to remind myself like they're not talking about me. They're talking about themselves. They're saying, Brittany, I'd like you to make content that I relate to. But they also forget there's like other people who watch. There's right. other people like some of my audience just watch my podcast. Some of them just watch the live shows. Some watch both. Right. But that's the point is I'm trying to create 
content for different parts of my audience. So what I'm realizing is that, again, it's they don't mean it in the way that my brain wants to process it, which is you're not good enough. Your piece of shit. Get better. Right. And so instead of like saying that to my brain, I have to be like, they're just letting me know that they like me and they want to continue watching me. Now, when I look at Andrew Tate and Greta and I see their recent feud on Twitter and all I see them doing is moving further and further into their bubbles, but also taking their audience with them. Their audience wants them to be bitter, wants them to be angry, wants them to attack, wants them to body shame. Even Hassan the other day was body shaming short kings. And I was like, Hassan, like the left, when I remember when Trump was like a big deal and I was a hardcore leftist and I'm watching Colbert and I'm watching all these progressives and they were like body shaming Trump. And I'm like, very confused. What are we doing? So then I was like, look, I want to body shame people. So if we're going to do it, let's fucking do it. But like, don't pretend you're not going to body shame and then you're going to body shame Trump because he's a bad person. Right. 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 Like, give me permission. Yeah. Give me permission to either be like petty and shameful, but don't pretend we're not doing it. Right. So I think there's a cognitive dissonance happening in the audiences that are pushing creators to continue it. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. why content creators and they make a lot of money. Like, girl, literally, I said to my VC today, I was like, should I pick a fight with Greta? Because it seems like a good way to get famous. And everyone's like, Brittany, you don't want to be famous. I was like, good point. Because I don't want to be famous. I just want to be rich enough to have babies. That's what I want to do. Everyone subscribe to my right. Patreon and OnlyFans. But like, I just, <laughs> I just want to have babies. But like, I live in an industry and in a work industry where people are always trying to pull me in. What was my first panel I ever did? Destiny texts me and goes, get the fuck on my panel. Lab is talking shit on you. That was my oh, first ever panel. I'm really? high as shit. I come on the panel. Everyone's yelling at me. Mr. Girl's yelling at me. And I'm just sitting here like, is this the height of wisdom on the internet? Is this, is this the greatest thing the internet has provided? And what is it? Mm-hmm. What sells? Drama, clicks, everything angry, everything better, even from our own, like, you know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So I can't even fault him because I love to watch it, girl. I love to right. watch it. So I'm like, yes. I'm, I'm a part of it. Yes. That's the piece that I think always catches me is I like, I want to treat like my meanness and, and, um, even sometimes maliciousness yeah. as a bad thing. I think maliciousness is probably maliciousness is something I avoid bad. as much as possible, yeah. but the meanness is sometimes it's a wake up call. I, the issue is I, I don't want to whitewash emotions. And I feel like saying being mean or angry is bad is like the most quintessentially white Protestant thing that we could possibly do. <laughs> and I feel like uh, th- this has been like most open to me. Like when I like spend time with like Nick's family, especially who are like very Jamaican and they're like super mean and like they go off at each other and they yell. And I'm just like, yeah, this family is so much healthier than my family. Yeah. <laughs> just cause they talk about it. They talk about it. Yeah. And like, when I get really mad and I'm like, this is fucking ridiculous. We can be mad at each other and it's still okay afterwards. Totally. Like we can also message each other after and be like, I still love you. Whereas like in my family, if something gets so bad to the point where like we're yelling at each other, um, like it is the apocalypse. Relationships might be ended. The bridges might be burned. Yeah. Who knows? Yeah. And we still cling to it because we like love each other, but it's like very scary. And it's like, this is the issue is like, Because sometimes when I talk to people and they're like, well, you shouldn't be as mean. And I'm like, I don't think that's it because I think there's a place and time to be mean, right? I don't want to be the person who people can come on stream. They can call me. They can make fun of me for being trans. They can make fun of my husband. They can make fun of how I look. They can call. Like they lie to their audience. They'll be nasty, like maximally nasty in every single way. I don't want to be the person that goes like, I understand that you're angry. Like, it's like, no, bitch, mm-hmm. fuck off. Mm-hmm. Like, if you're going to punch, I'm going to swing too. Mm-hmm. The issue is like, and so that I'm like, there's something that feels real. That feels like that is the correct thing to do. Yeah. But I don't want to become malicious. And I think yeah. that's the, that's the temptation of anger is I think it's easy to allow your anger to pull you into a space that's not good when my stalker first came at me I wanted her to die in like the slowest possible way I wanted to like torture her I was just like I want to hurt this woman with every fiber of my body and then I realized like no you know what I want I want to be able to just duel you I want to be able to have a fucking conversation and pull you on the internet and say this bitch is lying here's my evidence and I want her to be able to just take it accept it like accept that you're fucking lying and then she won't and then I want to duel her I just want to fight I want to be able to say I duel for I am bitch like I want to be able to seek out some personal 
firsthand justice that doesn't hurt her, doesn't send her to prison. I don't want her to go to jail for what? Like, I don't want to kill her for what? Like, I just want to do something that makes it feel like, hey, you can't just say shit. But the truth right. is she can. That truth is her videos are still up right now. And it doesn't matter. Anyone can say anything about me ever. So what I did is I created a term called gay judging, where I was like, I'm going to gay judge the fuck out of you, which says, I'm not trying to condemn you. I don't want to send you to hell. I don't want you to get in trouble. I don't want to say that you're the most evil person in the world. But I want to mm -hmm. be able to say like, sis, this is not it. This is not the path. Right. Mm -hmm. And then be like, this isn't it. But yet that's one of the most like debated things on my VC too. Like what is even gay judging? Everyone's so afraid of being judged. So what they do is they judge me in the process of judging. Right. They're like, pretty. how can you judge people this way? And I'm like, don't be yeah. a pussy. You're judging me right now for judging. But they right. don't want to admit it. Judging is a form of survival. But then co condemning someone, which is the religious sense of judging that Jesus and other like religious people say not to do because that's for God. Right. Right. That's where people get confused. So that bitterness is not the answer. When when Jesus like turned the tables over in the temple, he was not bitter. He was upset because they had desecrated the temple. They had offended right. God. But Jesus in that moment wasn't some bitter girl who was like slashing her boyfriend's tires. Right. Right. Well, he was like spreading lies about them. Right. Like right. He was pointing out that the disrespect is so offensive. You should be. You should feel right. the anger of Christ. Mm -hmm. right? right. So I feel like sometimes, and though I'm not a religious person, the lessons we learn in these religions can teach us in our secular lives how to remember that being respectful and being like living a life that is respectable means having at least values you can turn to even when life gets hard. But the right. problem is, is most people, when life gets hard, they don't have values to move back on. So the bitterness consumes them, the money consumes them, the sex consumes them, and, and then all of a sudden they become a person they don't even recognize. And yeah. they might alienate everyone around them, which might be their journey, might be their thing, and might, you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think at the end, like people should seek out their joy. And I think joyful people hurt people less. I think introspective people hurt people less. I think if we're patient and kind and willing, we don't have to always give in to our like most petty animal thoughts. But we're going to have them. And I think discipline is about having balance with those things, not saying that they don't exist, not pretending we're perfect, not pretending we don't judge, not pretending we don't want to kill people, not pretending we don't have these thoughts of like, bro, you're pissing me off. Mm. No, I won't say that story. Never mind. Okay. <laughs> Never mind. I was like, ah, this is, I've already been spicy enough today. I'm good. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I think that's, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, Cause to some extent we're saying like, how do you do authenticity? How do you yeah. do it real on the internet? Um, Ooh, well erasing all the things that are ugly for people to hear. Well, I think that's part of why I like I like you. <laughs> uh, this is why I like Max originally. Yeah. Because I, I wish there was more space, right? Like when you say something like, I just wanted to kill the bitch. Mm -hmm. So many people get like their liberal spectrum. They're like, oh, you can't say that. And it's like, she's not saying she wants to. She's not saying she, well, she did want to in that moment. She's not yeah. saying she's going to. <clears throat> she's definitely not saying that it's a good thing to, like, yeah. that you should act on this or it's even a good way to feel. She's saying it's deeply human that I felt this way. Everyone has felt that this way. This woman mentally destroyed me. This woman made me, like, like, I literally, th like, that's what I'm saying. Because they're not thinking about what she put me through. They're right. thinking about like the image or the outlook, or as my sister says, I'm a very unsympathetic character. So she goes, Brittany, like it's hard to sympathize with you because you come off so strong. People think strong people don't cry in their bedrooms and think about self-harming, right? But the mm -hmm. truth is, is I do, but it doesn't matter how many times I say it. And I don't want the internet to fucking pity me. I want them to humanize me. I want them to remember even my stalker should be humanized because she came from an environment and her brain took her on a journey that led her to thinking she can falsely accuse over 12 people of sex trafficking her when it never happened. Right. But that's a real yeah. person. That's like a con like a conscience that's like floating in the universe right now. She's a real person. Yeah. And I'm a real person. And I deserve to feel angry that this real person tried to try to destroy me mentally and physically and monetarily and everything in right. every way. Like we went to court. Have you been to court is the most scary experience of your life to watch a person who doesn't know you just go judgment. It is so scary. And then they have real life repercussions. Mm -hmm. It is so frightening for people like me who feel consistently like othered by the world. So again, I need to humanize her in order to humanize myself, though. I cannot mm -hmm. 
I cannot dehumanize her. Even though my penny energy says, if I get to, though, I get to be mean to her. If right. I do think she's bad, then I get to be ugly towards her. Yeah, she's ontologically evil. Nothing's off the table. Exactly. Exactly. Right. And I don't want to be that person. Right. Oh, yeah. Damn. That's so tough. Because it's like, the, the question always goes, is there anyone or anything that you can say is ontologically evil? Mm. And it's like, I don't know. I don't know the answer still. Um, because it's like, like I said, I've worked with people who are like really high in psychopathy. I'm going to be honest. <sighs> I, I, I don't know. I don't know how to humanize them. I don't, I don't know how to not just think like you're a really scary person. Who's yeah. A big, who's a very high risk. You're very dangerous. I never want to be around you personally. And every person you come into contact, you are going to actively harm. Yeah. And so like, is that person ontologically evil? It's like, kind of, kind of like, ah, I don't know. I like, it's that like hard line of like, is there any point at which you can say, fuck this person? Um, and, and I guess, Maybe I'm being low resolution. Maybe there are ways that you can say that mm. at like a at like a societal level, while at like a personal level, maybe you shouldn't, right? Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Or maybe there's some people that are so kind and good. I think about like Lex Friedman's. Like that man, mm. have you ever watched his podcast? Yeah, yeah. He just seems like somebody... He just got like a very sweet heart at the core of it. Like he just like if I genuinely think of Lex could wave a wand, he would want everyone to just get along and have hugs and kisses, and we would all just like sing High School Musical together. Yeah, like I unironically think that he thinks that that world's possible, and he wants to make it possible by like being kind to people. Yeah, uh, he believes in boundaries, obviously, but like he doesn't believe in being mean ever. Yeah, he seem I think he's a pacifist like actively as well. Um. And there's something to me that's really beautiful about it. Mm. And I can't get on board. Uh, but I will fight so hard for those people's dream to come true. Mm. Uh, mm. You know? Does that make sense? Yeah. There's a, a a book by Laurel K. Hamilton. It's the Anita Blake series. And there's a scene in which Anita's sort of like the tough girl in town. There's superpowers involved. Thank you. So like a weaker kind of person comes into her life and says, I need protection. And she goes, I'll protect you, but if your weakness and naivety get in the way and get someone I love killed, I'll kill you. And I sometimes read Lex's tweets and I'm like, my bro, you're going to get me killed one day. Because mm -hmm. the truth is, is that I don't live in a peaceful world where people don't right. want to kill me. I live in yes. a world where I better be tough or I'm going to die. So when I see mm -hmm. Lex, I'm like, you sweet boy. And then I love him and I hope I get to talk to him one day. I think he's really lovely. But I feel mm -hmm. like I'd need to protect him if shit hit the fan. Yes. Which is interesting. Me too. But that's, that is how I feel about him. Yeah, that I would have to protect him. Have you, have you ever read The Wheel of Time? Actually, no. My brother was a huge fan. I just never got into it. Okay. I really love the <clears throat> book. Uh, the book is exactly what I love reading in books, where it takes a whole bunch of archetypes and narratives that exist in the world, especially more historically, mm. and it tur dials them up to like maximum amount. And lets these characters like run loose in the world. Mm. So there's a group, uh, there's a group of people within the Wheel of Time called they're called the Tinkerers, look or like the Duathuan, and they have uh, this kind of it's essentially like a religious practice, but it's also like a way of life mm -hmm. um, called the Way of the Leaf, and they believe in maximal. Um, maximal pacifism so they have guard dogs but their guard dogs are trained not to bite they'll be mm. loud and scary but they will never physically attack or harm anything even uh like something called a trollic and a trollic is basically like a man human beast that isn't really a real person they're just like made in like they're like an orc from okay yeah uh, lord, lord of the, the rings. rings they're they're just like the embody evil and bestial like there there's nothing redeemable about them you're yeah. not supposed to empathize with them they're just like the big bear the scary. They're the big scary monster under the bed, right? Sure. And there's a number of stories of the Tuatha one that you hear about like repeatedly that makes, at least me as a viewer, feel some disdain for them while also feeling like deep love for them at the mm, same time. Yeah. And so like one thing that happens in the in the <clears> book <throat> is there's a tribe of Tuatha one and they've got children and a whole bunch of these trollics. So these like man, these like creature beasts attack them mm -hmm. and they're still not willing to kill them. And so they allow all of their children and women and themselves to just be brutally slaughtered and eaten oh. because they didn't want to do harm and they couldn't run away fast. Yeah. Enough. And I look at that and I'm like, that's not 
that's stupid. Yeah. Like, that that's where like I have the disdain for the pacifism. Yeah. Even though I want the world to exist that the Tuatha one could exist within. I want the world that they're talking about. And their their relief is like, well, if we just keep prophetizing it, if more people could be on board, we could just have yeah. the way of the leaf for everyone. And it's like, you're right, but there are trollocs out there. Yeah. So the way um, I've been phrasing it very specifically now that I'm in like this wonderful relationship where I've said, I love you so much. I'm going to commit myself to you. Please don't abuse that because I won't leave. <laughs> Please don't abuse my love. And I'm putting the responsibility on him to honor me and my feelings and vice versa, right? Like I'm saying, minus abuse, please don't abuse my love, right? I'm saying that to the world. Don't put me in a situation where I have to use self-defense. Please, please do not rob my house. Please do not me like let, do not force me to use my Second Amendment rights. Don't put me in this situation. And that's the hard part of life is that sometimes people, naively or intentionally, Put themselves in situations where people have to hurt them. Did you see recently? Oh, my God. This story is so interesting. Did you see recently the black woman at Walmart who took a white woman hostage? Uh, you mentioned it. I still haven't actually. Girl, she's like waving a gun around and she's screaming. I need a reporter. I need help. I need a reporter. I need help. And I really want to know what she needs help with. You know, I don't know what it is, but she's not hurting her. She's scaring her. This woman's petrified. She's definitely going to need some fucking therapy. You know, her, her, her co-workers are going to need therapy and the cops shoot her dead. So we'll never know what she needed help with. But in that moment, my empathy was so strong for bo- everyone involved where I was like, somebody ask her what she needs help with. Somebody get a freaking reporter out here because what if she's got five kids in a basement who need help? What if she's got seven puppies? What if she has a mental health problem and she just wants to be treated like a person? But then I think a tweet said it really well, which was like, I really feel for this woman. I really wish she had gotten the help she needed. But she put herself in a situation where somebody else needed more help than her in that moment. Right. And then she had to lose her life over it. And that sucks, bros. That, like, every part of me thinks that sucks so bad. But you know what? Mm -hmm. Fuck that woman. Because there's so many women who need help. So many men who need help. And they're doing the right, they're doing it the right way. Right. Same way I feel about my callers. When I get a caller, and I don't argue if I get, like, certain kinds of callers who are like, I'm a five. I'm like, okay, cool you're a five like I don't argue with people right because if right. they're gonna get angry and they're going the wrong way about like introspection or thinking about or challenging the self then I don't argue with them right I can't help a max I can't help a lav like I can't help people who can't go about it the right way now it's not to say that they have to do it the right way at the beginning not at all but once you're given the resources once you're being helped once people are telling you there is a right way and then you refuse it well at that point you know, there are better people to serve, better people to help. And at the same time, maybe the people who need the help the most are the people who can't quite figure it out. And so the yeah. I, the, the 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 problem is, is like as individuals, we can't save the planet. We can just help who we can help. Like, look, I think when you become introspective, you become less violent. I think you become more peaceful. I would love to live in a world where I never had to work out, stay in shape or be diligent when I walk down the road. Mm-hmm. And until I live in that world, I will be all those things. But I also have never killed anyone. I've also never raped anyone. I've never cheated on anyone. So frankly, I still feel like I'm doing it. Right. And I'm waiting for everyone else to catch up. Just just do those three things. Hmm. And I'm not yeah. sure that humanity is ready for it. So then I have to radically accept that they're not ready for it. Right. Yes. Yes. Which is why I try to like – I've mostly come to the, the piece of like um, I don't want to be mean – well, I do. I actually I am fine with being mean. I don't want to be cruel. Um, but yeah. sometimes if a monster comes in the midst of the night mm. to only like kill and destroy, yeah. Your only response is to attempt like is to go at it with swords, right? Yeah. Like, you must. Like sometimes some people are so hateful and so nasty and so um beyond the pale that your response and so hypocritical, especially, mm. that your response should be to shame them for their like worldview right like when i listen to christians like fundy christians talk about trans Mm -hmm, people mm -hmm. all i want to do is be mean yeah Um, (laughs) particularly when they say like no trust me yeah we're loving them we're loving them in god's name i'm like no you're not they hate you they hate you right if like the if like if you're really jesus like jesus hung out with tax collectors and prostitutes okay um i'm gonna promise you trans people don't want to hang out with you okay yeah 
<laughs> I'm gonna just say that, all right? Unless you fucking like trap them in your basement, they're not gonna spend time with you. You're doing something wrong here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think I just have to make peace with that, and I have to realize that the people that I perceive as like doing a, a serious harm, and I go at really hard, are going to hate me and are going to think I'm a bad person, and I might be, but I can. Uh, I have to just do the best I can to go after the right people and yeah. Uh, rain it in well i feel like even the people that are gonna feel like you're on their side the moment you do it different they're like whoa i thought you were better than this i thought you were different than this like i say the r word it's a part of my vocabulary i need you all to get over it but like they probably won't everyone will have an opinion about it and i get it but someone was Mm -hmm. like Brittany, i didn't know you say that word i was like oh wait until you find out what other words i say because that's the that's the easy one whoops i just dropped my notebook that's the kid word right Like, that's the problem is, like, because I think words are a construct created by culture, nothing matters to me except in context. You cannot Mm -hmm. convince me that anything matters unless it's in context. What's the difference between sex and consensual or sex and rape, like consensual sex and rape? The consent part. It's not the sex part. Right. So, again, everyone, like, gets it, like, skewed that the thing I'm offended by is, like, the sound I'm hearing or the thing I'm experiencing but what you're actually offended by is either the context in which you're perceiving it or the context in which you want it to be perceived rather than what's happening. And both could be true. Maybe you're perceiving it correctly. Maybe you're perceiving it incorrectly. But I think we do that too. Like what is our obligation as content creators? I originally thought my obligation was to be like a voice of like leadership. I think right now my obligation is to stay true to my values and to show people that if they push my buttons, I will delete my channel and kill myself. And that's not a joke. That existence is the reason I want to die. It is never my existing. I have a great life. I can pay my bills on time and I have a cat. Everything's great. Right? But the moment someone comes to me and says, you shouldn't exist, I'm like, great. Are you sure about that? Because I'm happy to die. But then when I'm happy to die, people tell me I'm crazy and they're like, how can you not want to exist? I'm like, man, look at the world. The world is constantly threatening people's existence. We're constantly telling people they shouldn't exist at every corner. And then everyone's expected to just be happy with existing. And I don't get it. Except I think people know it and they just don't want to admit it. That dying is sounds pretty reasonable when you present the world the way that everyone keeps presenting it. Like the world's ending. Like men are the worst. Like the patriarchy is taking over. Like feminists are destroying masculinity. Everything is doomsday. So why do right. we want to exist? Right. And then they, they, again, I don't think people know what they think they know. I think they mm. know that something feels wrong and they are seeing what is wrong and they're assuming that's what it is. But I think what's wrong is that no one's admitting that we participate in the world and we create it to be the way it is, myself included. Right. My inability to meet all people where they're at is going to contribute to somebody having a bad thought about me, categorizing me in a negative way, and then pursuing other people like me and treating them badly because they met me. Right. I'm not perfect. So I also contribute to the negative energy in the universe. And I think that is just so hard for people to process. And I think that's I think that's what existential dread is, is realizing like, oh, my God, what am I even doing here? Right. And if you don't have the answer, it makes you crazy. So then what is the answer? Because obviously you said you're pretty happy and stuff. So like, what is the answer you arrived at of like, um, like why why are you existing why do you continue to choose to exist uh the question my bestie posed to me recently which was really beautiful he said how how like how much of existence so anything outside of myself am i willing to face and deal with to continue existing and right now i'm in a space where i am able to keep going the more i gather tools the easier it becomes but even i have limits so when i was at my last limit I went to therapy and gained a new tool and I could keep going. When I was still struggling, I went and lived on a farm and got off the internet and I gained a new tool and I kept going. So basically, I get to keep going until I run out of tools. If I ever run out of tools, at least I know I could always bite off my tongue and drown in my own blood. (laughs) Okay? (laughs) But like, if I ever run out of tools, I'll face that when it comes. But I do like being alive. Mm -hmm. I really like waking up every day. I like getting older. I like hanging out with my family and friends. But the moment I get this feeling of being suffocated by existence out of love, I start to panic. My brain goes, oh, here we go. It's coming. 
Because again, I'm being told from everyone, I love you, stop being queer. I love you, get off the internet. I love you, don't get married too quick. I love you, you're wrong. I love you, you're ugly. I love you, I love you, I hate you. I love you, and I'm, it's a lot. Right. So I just kind of like, doop. And I always choose my sanity over money. That's like a big rule. Because mm-hmm. I used to burn myself out working three jobs, trying to make a million dollars, trying to do all the things I was told I was supposed to do. And then now I just don't do it, which is crazy because I am passing up so much money and I could have a baby tomorrow if I could do it. But if I do it, I'll probably become manic again and then I'll probably self-harm. I haven't self-harmed in a while. So I'm trying really hard to stay stable. So I think like why is because I just don't know anything. I've accepted it and I've fully accepted that I really think I'm an animal evolved over time and this is the best I can do. And I think it's good enough. I really think I'm good enough. I it makes me. I'm curious what you think about this because you said tools. <clears throat> uh, I'm curious what you're including in that. Um, mm. Our favorite movie, Everything, Everywhere, All at Once. I don't know if it actually is your favorite movie. Is it's it your favorite movie? Top ten, girl. Top ten. <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Um, it's super cool because it's it's essentially um, it's an answer to nihilism and postmodernism mm, for sure. Because right? it's like it's like post postmodernism. Yeah. It's like, yeah. Nothing matters is kind of the premise of the movie. And so then at the end, you get to the point where um, I love when, what's the husband's name? Waymond. Raymond. Waymond. Waymond. Mm-hmm. When Waymond says, uh, ple- like, he basically says, like, my optimism is a tactical decision. Yeah. Right? Like, when you hear that, is that like a tool in part? Yes. Therapy gave okay. me optimism. Okay. And so when Joy says, uh, not not joy sorry when what's the mom i evelyn I'm evelyn. evelyn yeah when evelyn chases after joy and she says you are my joy right yeah and you get to this point of realizing because <clears throat> nothing matters all that matters is who you choose yeah like what you make matter is that a tool in your head absolutely Bra- okay, like okay. absolutely like literally i don't that's why i have my inner circle and then everyone else and then everyone else like i have my outer inner circle and then everyone else because I asked myself, I, I traveled solo around the U.S., 20,000 miles, two trip, trips, cities, and then national parks all by myself. With Second trip was with my cat. I was in a forest. I was sitting there in the middle of nowhere in a pitch black forest with no service, definitely afraid of bears. I was holding my axe, and I'm high as fuck, and I'm like, what am I doing with my life? And I'm like, I saw myself like zoomed out into the universe and had this really like, this is what I call my three moment on my levels, where I was like, what am I doing? And I was like, if I died here, nobody would fucking care. Nobody would know. My parents would know because I'm supposed to contact them every three days to let them know I'm alive. Like my family would know. And those were the people that I realized like my parents might have given me borderline. (laughs) Okay. I might have gone home this last Christmas and been like gold star Brittany didn't get triggered because like every Christmas I get, you know what I mean? I might like be very proud of myself for a lot of reasons. And I might explain my family like they're the most toxic, wonderful people I've ever met. But they are the people who, regardless of how ugly I have been, still think I'm beautiful. So Evelyn learns that Waymond isn't ideal, but damn, is he perfect because he's he's what she has. And he loves her unconditionally, even though Evelyn treats him like shit. Right. Because she's so bitter at herself. So I learned that even though I have to mother my parents. And even though I have to like mother everyone and even though as my brothers are on this Andrew Tate fucking bubble thing they're in where my brother has the audacity to be like, you're not even working that hard. You don't even work that hard as I'm literally paying people's rent. (laughs) And I have to sit there and be like, I'm cutting you off. This is it, baby. I'm cutting everyone off. Right. Like I have to sit there and realize like these are still the best people in the whole planet on the whole planet. These people give me life because these people get to see me and I get to see them in their ugliest moments and I still love them. I don't love a lot of people in their ugly moments, girl. I hit that block button like nobody's business. Block, 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 block. But these people, these consciousnesses that are roaming the universe, these are mine. And that is worth existing every day. Finding my partner, like being picky as fuck and having destiny and all these people tell me like I'm being stupid for being so picky. Finding this person finally, and I'm like, that one. Like, that reassures me that the joy that Brittany needs is possible, and I'm finding it. But it starts with me knowing myself. 
Right. And like accepting that I'm a speck in the universe and nothing matters. So the only thing that matters is what I've decided matters. And I pick very carefully. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's interesting because I feel like so many people like hear you say all this stuff about like, I, I feel like so many people in our society try to act like what you're describing is so insignificant. Mm, like mm-hmm. what? So the only thing that keeps you from killing yourself is your family. And it's like, I wish more people would realize that that's the only thing that we have to pick most of the time. Most people aren't supposed to be great men who change the world and you don't have to be. Like sometimes changing the world is just like. Oh, what does that even mean, Kyla? Martin Luther King Jr. cheated on his wife and plagiarized his papers. Uh, Hitler died in the most pathetic way possible. Uh, Alan Watts was this great philosopher who died of alcoholism. What does that mean to be a person who changes the fucking world? Right. Fuck your world. Exactly. Like, exactly. you know what I'm saying? Like, you you fucked the people in, who are the most important to you. Like, literally, like, fuck your world. You didn't even do right by the people directly in front of you. So, no. Mm. Like, fuck that theory. That theory that distracts us from the people we love the most. So you can go save total strangers who won't give a fuck about you in 200 years. But your family right now, your children right now, they need you. So Mm. continue choosing work over your family and your kids. Continue choosing your legend and your name and your reputation. And then your kids can write books about it 20 years from now about how their father wasn't present in their life. Right. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. You're good. Um, (laughs) Yeah. It's it's interesting. Yeah, that's a really good point. It's like we obsess about these great men, but like who are they? Um, Who really are they? because I'd like to think like, I try to think about like the greatest people in my life. And it's like, none of them are famous. Mm. None of them are going to go down in history. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause I think like, I think family is, I wish family was more like by blood and I think it can be, but I think mm. it's also people you choose. I Absolutely. recognize that there are some people who can't like reconcile things with their family. Absolutely. Um, Chosen family is super important. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I, I can think about the person who like, was probably the most important to my childhood growing up. And so I guess like, this is the thing I think I maybe I always get stuck on is like, you're right. Your family and the people in your life matter most, but it's like, there's something really beautiful. He's not famous, but there was a guy, his name is Marty. He's a horse trainer, um, out of Southern Alberta. Uh, he is, it's magnetic to watch him. He'll, he'll like be riding this horse that's like running around and he'll be drinking his coffee. No, not touching the, not touching the like. Let's go, Marty. Reins at all. And he'll be spinning the horse and it'll be running Holy and sliding shit. stop. It's incredible. He is, he's a magician with horses. It's, it's incredible. It's, it's, it's an art to watch. Yeah. And he took the time to come and like talk with a bunch of like broken kids about how to be connected to their horses. And I, I still look at him as like one of the greatest men because like. I think in my, like, I, I think I told you a little bit, one of my biggest struggles in my whole life is being seen, which mm-hmm. is ironic that I ended up at social media where I will never be seen. Yeah. <laughs> but um, uh, it's probably not ironic, actually. <laughs> it's probably it's a good, precisely. It's, it's a good it's attempt. Why it's the greatest now. place, though. You're sending a little beacon. You're saying, hey, anyone out there? No. And I think why he mattered so much to me is he was the first time in my entire life that somebody actually saw me. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is really unique because he didn't really know me. Mm-hmm. but. He really saw me and he just said like a couple of things. Like I, he was thinking about buying a horse. There was two horses he was thinking about buying. And one of them he wanted to buy was like my, like I was obsessed with this horse and he found out that I was obsessed with it. And he was like, Oh, that would be perfect. And it's like, fuck, I got the horse. He took a different horse. And because of him, I had that horse for like 10 years and that horse could have been way more trained. It would have been probably like, I mean, the horse I got was uh, crazy. Like just, just a very 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 nice horse uh, that I got for like 500 bucks and he probably could have made it like almost world class yeah and it was not world class with me okay he was he's not he's a nice horse but he's not world class he's kind of a, a brat um but he was just he just saw me it's like I can't even think of a sp- like he had a couple of really good quotes but they're not really what changed me I think all that matters is that he like saw me he saw me yeah. and he looked at me and he said like I think you're just good yeah and and so that's that's the like trade off. It's like when I think about great men, I'm not I'm not actually talking about famous people that right. change the world. Right. I don't really care. I'm really talking about like Bardies, um, who like go out into the world and do their best. They live by their principles, 
And they try to treat people as good as they can. And every now and then they see people. And yeah. like Marty was pretty special. I mean, every single person at that center said that Marty saw them, right? So like he was gifted at that. And like when I think about a great man, I'm not thinking, I'm not thinking about like the most famous men in the world. I'm thinking about Marty. Yeah. And it's like, I want to be Marty. I want to like be able to see people because sometimes that's all we can give each other. Yeah. In high school. Um, so I was homeschooled my whole life until I was 15. Then I went to public school for two years before my first cousin ended up bullying me out of high school. It was a mess. But during that two years, um, I went from being an avid reader to be like resenting books and not wanting to read. And then I had this English slash drama teacher. I had him for both classes who came into my life as like a Democrat. And I was like a closeted lesbian, Republican, bisexual, queer kid who was like struggling in drama <laughs> class. Yep. And he saw me and he decided that he would bully me in a very loving way that I needed because I need to be bullied in a very particular way because that's how my family is. My family, mm -hmm. we bully each other. And like it's in it, it's, if it ever crosses a line into real bullying, we're like, whoa, everybody, whoa. But he really knew how to do it. So like in school, kids would be like, he's your, like he, you're his favorite and he gives you like, you know, like um, leniency. Like he's leaning on you. I was like, oh, would you like to be his favorite? Because he makes me write an extra essay every week. Well, you bitches get to write one. I have to write two. <laughs> he made me his favorite and made me work twice as hard hmm. one summer he gave me three books and he's like read these and i was like uh, is this for school he's like no read them and i was like it wasn't a choice but it was he was giving me an opportunity to challenge myself because i told him i hated reading again even though i'd read so much as a child and then i didn't stop reading i've read over two thousand books since then right like just keep reading and reading and reading and he was a person who, when my parents came to one one of my plays and decided it was offensive and never came again, so I'd show up to everything by myself, he was there. And then one time, my dad got really mad at me for bringing a home book about a lesbian, um, a straight boy who falls in love with a lesbian. Okay. And I, my dad didn't talk to me for like two years. He made me say good morning and good night time every time. I had to see him and I had to talk to him, but he never replied. And this was my parents' version of, like, discipline. Right. Right? And so I'm sitting here in this home that I know all the white people in the audience right now are freaking out. Calm down. But, like, okay, I'm coming from an immigrant background where my parents are doing what they – better than what their parents did to them. Their parents were even meaner, but also wonderfully good people. And this mm -hmm. teacher looked at me and said, you need to apologize to your dad, even though you are in the right. And I said, why? And he said, because if you don't, you're never going to talk to your father again. And the truth is, is that my dad, when I got my period, I called my dad. When I went through girl troubles, I called my dad. When I went through boy troubles, I called my dad. I call my dad now. So here I was, like, I think 16 at the time, I guess, maybe on the verge of 17. I go to my dad on his birthday to try to apologize to him. He goes, nope, don't want to talk to you. I go, okay. I cry about it. I come back the next day. I try again. Dad, I'd like to talk to you. I apologize to him for disrespecting him. Very particular kind of apology. My dad accepted it, and all of a sudden we're talking again. And we're good, like, from, from basically that point on, give or take a couple of instances. Okay? My parents raise, were raised in a very hostile environment in a country that was war-torn. They come to America and give their kids everything, and their kid just grows up so different than they wanted. But this man who came into my life saw me, and I still do the same thing now, which is, like, sometimes you have to be the bigger person. And sometimes you want to kill yourself over it because it's so much work, but it so serves my joy. So when people look mm -hmm. at me and say, Brittany, delete these people from your life. Like my parents aren't coming to my wedding, right? Because it's not a Catholic wedding. And even though like that's the dream, I'm not going to get it. People are like, delete them from your life. But nobody understands that these people see me in a way that even the people who, who treat me better don't see me. And so I need them in my life to facilitate my joy. But it started with this one man who came into my life and gave me a tool I'll never forget, which is being the bigger person is a selfish move that serves your joy and helps people grow. Over the years, my parents have adapted my therapy like sessions into their vocabulary. They've adapted my concepts into their life. They're slowly getting better, but they're not perfect. And even though it's tough and hard work, if you want people to see you and understand you and you want them to treat you better, I think you have to do it first. Mm. And no... It is not easy. It is not easy looking at the person in like, I'm sure a lot of people will relate to this. When your parents apologize, they go, I'm sorry you feel that way. I'm sorry you think I was a bad mom when I tried so hard. I'm sorry. It's not a real apology. I'm never going to get one of those from my parents. Right. 
And so radically accepting them allowed me to radically accept that I could live in a world that outside of my parents were going to treat me the same way. Because the world doesn't treat me any better, fuckers. They're under this illusion that they're going to treat me better. No, they're not. They don't see me either. They see me even less than these people. Because ultimately, when shit hit the fan with my stalker, it was my family who went, Brittany must have had a reason. Whatever she did, must have had a reason. Because they know ultimately I'm a good person. And who were the first people to doubt me? These so-called friends who love me, quote unquote, more. Right. Right? So again... All I'm trying to say is that when we talk about being seen, someone on the VC asked me today, like, what was my loneliest time? It wasn't that I, it wasn't physically being alone. I've been surrounded by people my whole life. I come, I have nine siblings. It's being in a room full of people and still not being seen. That is my journey in loneliness. And because I'm a slut, I was never without physical contact. I was never without, because I'm, I'll go for the basics. I'll go for a watered down soup girl. Okay. Some people won't. I will. So I don't have to go without being like physically touched or whatever. I'll go for the yeah. subpar, okay? <laughs> but I'm still aiming for the thing I want to facilitate my true joy. And I think that is a lot harder because it forces you to face what you're really willing to accept out of existence. Mm. So my level is not other people's level. I'm not saying you should live my way. I'm just saying when people say like, I want to be seen, what parts of you need to be seen for you to feel joy? Right. Right? Yeah. Thank you for monolo- letting me monologue. <laughs> I've been monologuing all night, so you're good. <laughs> hmm. Interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting. I had like a million thoughts, but now I'm just sitting with what, where you ended it. I think um, this ties into like the audience question in the beginning. I I don't think your audience can ever see you. Mm-hmm. I think they only see the parts of you you present. And even then they get it wrong, at least yes. from my experience. And even my besties can get it wrong. Like I have a bestie who's kind of upset on my behalf. And I'm like, don't be. Right. If I'm not allowed to be, you can't be. Right. Because I don't want myself to give into my 15-year-old borderline unstable urges of being like nobody loves me nobody loves me people love me even if they don't love me in the way that I need they love me in the way they can give me and I think that's what I need Mm. I don't because it's about consent at the end of the day can't force people to love me the way I want to be loved I can only make my boundaries clear and people can either meet me where I can but I can't force people to love me the way I need to be loved I can only be okay with the fact that I might not meet all those people. Now, I feel like I've met it in my partner, and I feel like that was always going to be my story. Some people get everything they need from multiple people, right? That's why Polly works so well. But for me, I know for a fact that I'm going to get 99% of what I need from the universe from one person. And I always knew that was going to be my story. I just think I tried other things in the meantime. Because I was Polly for 12 years or 10 years. I tried different things. I tried different methods. Try as many as it takes talking about getting tools. But ultimately, my story, like my trope, was always going to have one partner. I was always going to end up with one person who could really see me. And I'm, and I'm glad that I found him. But, you know, it took me 33 years. That's a, that's, yeah. a, that's a second. I got people who are like, I'm 19. Where is he? Where is she? And I'm like, girl, you might need to wait. My mom needed to get arranged, married, and have two kids before she found my dad. Yeah. You never yeah. know your journey. Yeah. You just never know what it's going to be. But if you see- keep seeking out your joy, I think you'll find it. Mm. That's super interesting. Yeah. There's like so many little like nuggets in there that I think about. Like part of it is like a margin of error, right? It sounds like. Like, I, I think love is seeing people with a large margin of error, which we really fail to have. And I don't think you have to always see everyone. And I think, I, I think f- fundamentally people, different people are called to different things, right? Totally. Um, right. Like a large per- portion of your journey personally is dealing with mental illness, which means necessarily <laughs> you have to have different boundaries in your life that yeah. like, to be honest, neurotypical, not as severely mentally ill people have the luxury of not needing as much. Right. Yeah. So it's like, the people that I can maybe have like maybe softer boundaries with, because for you, it's like boundary cross. And that's kind of the, that's the end of the the, the road, except for with your family, basically. Yeah, basically. 
right? Whereas like, and that makes sense, especially as somebody who's recovered from borderline. That makes a lot of sense to me. Um, uh, hashtag trauma informed. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Um, whereas like for, for me, I tend to be able to navigate that more but i've never really had to struggle through like pretty significant mental illness like i've just been really blessed in that way um like i have struggles and stuff like that it's just that's not one of them yeah um and it's so it's so interesting this is the same experience i have when when i talk with like mentally ill people or including like people with addictions so like much more severe is when they talk about like the structures that they've needed to implement to essentially like essentially find their joy to like be happy whole and well yeah um people are like so judgy about it. And they're like, that's yep. horrible. Yeah. And you're like, bro, they're not prescribing it. They're yes. really not. They're just being fucking honest about what they needed. And like the reality is like for some people, you have to go to extreme lengths to like make yourself be okay. Right. Yes. Assum assuming that you're not harming other people. Right. Right. Um, yeah. Right. Like for, for some addicts, it's like, if somebody drinks in my presence, I I will have to cut you off. Like you can't be in my life. I'll maybe like some people are like, I'll give you one warning and then you're mm. gone. But it's like for them, they're like, if I drink again, it will kill me. It yeah. will kill me. And I can't have people in my life that don't take the gravity of that struggle seriously enough. Like I, I can't risk it because you're literally asking me to pick you crossing my boundaries over my life. I can't right. do it. Right. Whereas it's like somebody like me, if somebody crosses my boundary, it's not a life or death issue. I'm not asking uh, like when you cross that boundary, the 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 harm that you've done to me isn't having me choose between my life and the boundary cross. But for like, especially like like you said with borderline, where it's like, so I said is always an option in the back of your mind, right? It's like yeah. you really do need to have people in your life that realize the gravity of what the boundaries mean to you. But that doesn't mean that you're prescribing to everyone else that they should have these like really intense rigid boundaries, right? Like you always like that's why you did the the date thing with me where you're like let's do a date, let's see how long you make it, and I made like a minute and a half. Yeah, you were very very narrow in what you wanted. And right. It's like, most people don't need to do that, and that's fine. But Brittany did. Yeah. And that's okay too. She's not saying you have to do it. They um I think um it's like from what I understand from my friends who are addicts it's like when they hit recovery their friends feel like you're judging them like oh you think you're better than us I felt yeah. that way when I recovered or was in recovery my other mentally ill friends were like okay but Brittany like you can't just like get better overnight and I was like overnight girl this is a 30 year plus process like mm -hmm. people like I think Destiny asked me one time like how long have you been single and I'm like 33 years because when I was in relationships, like, they didn't, they weren't the one. So I was, I was in a relationship, but, like, how long have you been dating? 33 years. You know what I mean? Like, I, like, there is no, there, if, unless something works, it's just the thing you're trying. It's just a moment in time, right? So for me, I guess, when I, when I pick myself, I'm not rejecting people, but it feels that way. Yes. But, you know, I one of the things I love about my sister and I is like we formed this like very negotiated relationship where like she's like, hey, I love you. I'm going to spoon. Can't talk to you right now. I'm like, OK, bye. And I know for a fact that that took years to get to that point of her saying, hey, I can't be there for you right now. And my borderline being like, if she's not here for me now, will she be there for me later? And is she there now? And like, like I had to go through. And even now I have insane intrusive thoughts like they are extremely spoon draining and I have to just like even when I'm talking to my partner and if we have like a heavy conversation about our life because we're doing very adult things we're talking mm -hmm. about making babies like that's a big deal I know some people just do it flippantly but like that's a, such a big deal to me I'm like I'm gonna pass I could pass on so many of my problems like I'm thinking about the consequences it can drain me to the point where like I love you so much I need to go take a shower and he knows that just means I need to recharge my spoons. I need to touch water. I need to go. He's not thinking I'm rejecting. I'm being rejected. But I know for a fact that if I dated somebody who wasn't aware of mental health, they wouldn't know what to do. Like I dated this guy. Maybe I told you about this. He was so nice. And I asked him, have you ever dealt with mental health? Like PTSD, um, anything, like eating disorder, anything. And he's like, no. And I was like, okay. So we just don't have a family who talks about it, right? He was a person of color. That makes sense, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. I said, I am concerned that when I'm in a manic or like not even real borderline, like I'm just slightly upset in a borderline way, not even full triggered, that I'm going to send the wrong message to you and you're going to hear it as like wrong. Like right. I did this. I recently disassociated while my partner was with me. And when I disassociate, I lose all my senses. I can't smell him. I can't remember. I love him. Like I don't feel anything. 
And I sat there. I'm like, I am so sorry that the last night we're together, I've disassociated. And it happened in a split second because of a slight. He said one thing, which was so fair. It was a wonderfully neutral thing. And my brain so quickly was like, oh, this is it. This is what it reminds me of. And all of a sudden I was like, fuck. And I was like, so up, like, I was so upset. I was like, he's like, Brittany, our last night together is our last night here. It's not our last night together. And I was like, I know that, but I would like to spend the last night together making love. And right now I can't do that because I don't feel connected to you. And so logically I am communicating to him that I am disassociated and I am so sorry. And he knows, and he even said, he said something to me that no one's ever been able to say because he's my first partner after therapy, which is Mm -hmm. like, he's like, you communicating that you're disassociated is like amazing. And I was like, thank you. Because the truth is, is I don't know how many tools I actually learned from therapy for a new relationship because I was out of it by the time, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So he's the first test. And I don't think a person who understands disassociation wouldn't, I don't think they'd know how to handle that. Like I asked him at one point, I was like, can you come into the bathroom and watch me shower so I can see if I can feel normal again? Because water is my element. I went in there. He's watching me shower. I'm like looking at him. And I'm just like, I'm so sorry, babe. I I can't remember that I love you, but I know logically that I do. He's like, I know. I'll wait. And he just sat there and waited and we waited a few hours. We went to bed. We woke up. I finally came back to myself, but he just, he understands mental health so he can humanize me in that moment versus my Mm -hmm. parents who I love. They don't even believe in my borderline, right? So it's kind of hard sometimes because even though they know I'm upset, they just call it like, oh, Brittany's being emotional. Right. Or like the other day, my little brother was tackling me with a pillow. And though normally that is fun. Hi, Nick. She says hi. Hey, Brittany. And even though normally that's fun and I like being hit with a pillow, I was like, hey, safe word. You're going to trigger my PTSD. I'm in a really like vulnerable space right now because he Mm -hmm. like covered my head with a blanket, which is like a direct way to trigger my PTSD. And he did it one more time. And I was like, stop. You need to believe in mental health in this one moment. I know you don't, but right now you need to really believe in it because you're going to fucking trigger me and I'm going to go kill myself. And he like looked at me and he's like, fuck, you know, I really hate that you're sick. And I was like, yeah, me too. So again, I'm dealing with a bunch of people who live in different realities and different bubbles. And instead of being bitter and angry, I have to humanize them so they can humanize me. And that tactic and that tool seems to work the best. Yeah. Uh, it's so interesting. I feel like, I don't know how you'll feel about this. Tell I'm going to tell you how I think about you oh. in one way. And then I want you to tell me how you feel about it too. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. But I know you, I know you love the here and now stuff too, for the most part too. <laughs> Just talking about the dynamic between us. Uh, so I have a couple people in my life that are, have different varying levels of mental illness and are so good. They're just good people. They mean well, they just need to be seen complexly. Mm. I'm not perfect at it all the time by any means, uh, but I kind of view them as like perfect litmus tests for me to gauge if people actually know what they're talking about when they say like, mm. when they talk about like mental health and who I can actually respect when they're like giving me a critique, maybe on like a mental health related thing or something like that. So one of them is like uh, a roommate of mine because he has autism and he is so sweet and lovely. He is like maybe one of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. He is just a sweet little snookum. And he's very annoying because he says extremely inappropriate things at all times. Like, yeah. do you want to cover my ass? He just says it constantly. Um, it's extremely funny. I love watching people's reactions when he says it. Uh, he's just very sexually gratuitous in the way yeah. that he jokes with people, which is not always the most appropriate thing. To- I think it's fucking hilarious. Yeah. I love it. Um, and The thing is, is like, you can tell that he's just well-meaning. Like, he's just sweet. It's so funny. It's so my chat's losing their brains right now. Um, And so that's one of my, and then when some people talk to him, they fucking hate him. And they Mm -hmm. read him in like the most negative way possible. And the moment somebody does that, I go, I don't trust your read on people. Ah, yeah, yeah. I don't don't care a single fuck what you have to say about other people. Mm -hmm. I don't trust you. And I kind of feel that way with you as well, where it's just like, I don't know how you engage with you and your content and you don't like, and you don't see that you're just good and mm. kind um, and messy and you own that you're messy and you're not pretending like you're not mentally ill. And you're very, very like clear and open to being like, being like, this is borderline thin. It's not you. It's me. It's going to upset you. That's totally fair. It is my responsibility. I'll fix it when I can. But right now it just is what it is. Yeah. I got borderline. And so when, when people read you in such a way, 
as like really, especially like really negative. Like anyone who reads you in like the paranoid fuck way, like, oh, she must be manipulative. I'm just like, oh, okay. You have a terrible read on people. I do not trust what you say about anyone. Good to know. Mm. Um, won't trust you when you say anything about anyone in the future ever again. Um, I don't know how you feel about that. I'm curious to know. Um, obviously honored, but um, I want okay. to- I, I was worried you'd be upset by that. So is that okay? No, no, I no. I um, Obviously, yeah. Like I want to be seen in a light in which um, I am a good person. But also um, that my neurodivergency or whatever you want to call it, mental health, because that's the fear of being other, is that no matter what you do, you'll be seen for someone you're not. I would love to be seen and then criticized. Mm -hmm. I would love to be held accountable when I've actually done something outside of my values. Not other people's values, my values. I would love to be like tortured appropriately if I have earned it. I do not want to be tortured unjustly. Right. Right? Mm. Like, I was already forced into this existence, which is fine. <laughs> My parents made love on a beach, and I was born. It makes sense that I love water so much, right? <laughs> That's actually so funny. Right? Yeah. I am – I will accept that I exist, but really existence is what hurts me. Like, dealing with other people who see you and just think awful things about you or dismiss yeah. you – and the funniest part about it is, like, I don't blame them because, like, they're just using the tools they have to put me in a category. Um, <clears throat> so I appreciate, I guess, that I feel like you probably see me closer to how I see myself, which means that I can also trust you because I know myself and I know my reputation. I've been on the Internet. I have, like, thousands of videos. I have tons of collabs. People can see me be consistent. Mm -hmm. um, but it's nice that you, I guess, see me in that way even though we've only known each other a short time, right? Um, I, I hope that everyone, I, I think that's the greatest skill I learned is accepting that my perception informed by borderline and PTSD was causing me to misread people and unknowingly torture them. Mm. And then I was perpetuating that cycle that makes me want to kill myself by putting people in boxes and alienating them. When I was in high school, my first cousin who accused me of molesting her and then 10 years later denied it, it was a whole mess. She also accused another boy of the school of doing the same thing, touching her boobs. That was the molestation ac accusation. And mm -hmm. when she accused this boy, we were like, oh, I can't believe he did that. And we all just stopped talking to him. We were all in theater together. And I just ostracized this kid, the nicest kid in the whole world. And I just believed her. Mm -hmm. And when she accused me of it, I had this flashback of this boy. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm not the first one. And then like 10 years later, he was working at a funeral home when my grandma died and I saw him. And my biggest regret for my whole life is not going up to him and saying, I believe you. Because he denied it through and through. Yeah. And no one heard him out. And I know how much it tortured me to have my cousin accuse me of that after I came out to her as a, a gay person. But I also know that it must have haunted him. Yeah. Right? So I guess like... I have to remember that in every way that I dehumanized someone else and didn't give them a chance, like I created an environment that makes me want to die all the time. Mm -hmm. So like one more person that can kind of see me is one more person that like doesn't make me want to die. Mm. So yeah. that's why I think I value our friendship and the fact that we negotiated it. And it like, <laughs> you seem to be okay with my weirdness. <laughs> I'm totally okay with it. Just to be clear, I don't see Brittany as like, I'm sure you know this, but I'm going to say this so that like viewers realize this as well. So that if viewers are like, Kyla's doing the right thing, I want to make sure they really understand what I'm saying. I, I think you see what I'm saying though, which is uh, when I'm saying that like as a litmus test, I don't see Brittany as just a borderline person, right? I see right. Brittany as Brittany. <clears throat> and I realize that part of Brittany that causes people to misread her, part of like the struggle that Brittany has is borderline makes her really hard to see. And I get that. Same with my roommate. My roommate is just my roommate and he has autism. Yeah. And that autism makes him really, really hard to see. And people who don't try when somebody is so obviously good in every one of their actions and there's that consistency in how they treat people, that that just tells me something about the person. Like somebody who's unwilling to even try to give you the benefit of the doubt about their read of character, to me says something more about them than it would ever say about you. Um, that's you, what I mean by it. I'm not trying to like tokenize you as like, yeah, yeah, my yeah. borderline person. That's no, no. All, Do you obviously. think though, it's like, I think it's a matter of tools. I mm -hmm. think it's also a matter of like willingness and where they are in their journey. So like, 
Do you know that second conversation? Well, you probably don't remember, but I had this second conversation with Steven Destiny. And I had this hope that he was going to see me in a way that I could finally have this conversation with somebody. And he didn't. But that same day that I was talking to him, that same era of time, my partner, my, my now partner, his friend was like, you should look at this stupid girl named Brittany Simon. She's so dumb. <laughs> How he saw you? Yeah, basically, his friend like hated me at first, like his bestie who has now met me and we're in love. But like, okay, so like <laughs> we're like besties now. But like, he came on and he's watching me. And he's like, no, I kind of get it. Like, does no one get it? Oh, okay, I get it. And then yeah. all of a sudden, I've got one person in the whole universe. Out of all my friends, like out of all the things, who like somehow can understand Brittany, and he's the only person that I talk myself with, like literally myself. Like, I don't even think about censoring myself. I, right, right now, I'm thinking about it, right? I'm like, people are watching. Like, I have to say things that make sense. When I'm with him, I just say a bunch of words. And sometimes people be like, I feel like I know what you're saying, but I, I also sound kind of just like vomit. Can you, like, rephrase it? I'll rephrase it, and he'll be like, yeah, okay, that's what I thought. But, like, I just wanted to also make sure that I'm not – because we still haven't known each other, like, the longest time. But that's what's so amazing about it is that no one my whole life has been able to do this. Not one person, not my sister, not my mother, not my ex-boyfriends, not my ex-girlfriends, not my besties. And it doesn't make their relationships with me worse. It makes the relationship I have with him the best, the perfect one, mm. the one that's supposed to see me when I'm ugly, when we're having sex, when I'm struggling, when I'm joyful, the one who's supposed to see me in all moments. Because my mom is certainly not supposed to be my lover. Right. You know? Okay. And that's I, what I need to figure out. Okay. What, 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 what? Because uh, I struggle with not being seen, but I have the wrong approach to it. It's not bad when people don't see me. It's good when people do. Yeah. I'm so honored. I'm so lucky. I'm so lucky mm -hmm. when people get to. It's awesome. Because yeah. I feel like I'm yeah. on, like, uh, the, I think I've told you I feel like I'm on an island and I'm just waving at all these cool people. And everyone is cool. That's the problem. I think most people are awesome and interesting. Genuinely, I didn't always think that yeah. I hate people emotionally, but then not really because I think that hate comes from the fact that I can't be friends with all of them because <laughs> right. they won't get along with me. But I really like people. Obviously, this is my job and I talk to people, but I I think I run into the problem where because my audience and this is the part of loneliness that really needs to be talked about. Because I like them and because there's no one else in their life, particularly at this moment. They go, oh, Brittany could be that person for me, my next inner circle, the person who sees me. Instead of just being grateful that someone for this moment of time sees them and now they can gain a tool to go get it from someone else. Right. So what they do is they like fantasize me and pedestal me and then forget that I've already said my consent matters and my inner circle's full. I cannot right. be your 2 a.m. I can be this kind of friend. I can come on a Thursday night and do a stream with you. This is awesome. I love this. But if you were like, Brittany, I need you to stream every night. Girl, I don't even stream every night myself, okay? <laughs> I'm doing this because this is the time that worked for us, and I'm happy to do it. But if you were like, I need you every night, I'd be like, ooh, my mental health is going to take a dip, right? Yeah. And and I understand why someone might request that. Like, Steven's always like, why don't you stream more? And I was like, why don't I kill myself? I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I just, I get it. Like, I get what it looks like. Yeah. You know, but yeah, I think it's an honor when I get to connect with a caller or like a viewer or anybody or you like I'm just like, fuck, yeah, like one more person, one more person, one more person. But in no way do I want to overstep, assume, hope. I just want to accept what can you offer me? Actually, my partner, when we first started talking, I said, please just one thousand percent be yourself and whatever relationship we're supposed to have will form naturally. We weren't sure if we were going to be friends, lovers, married. We just weren't sure. And then because we were able to be ourselves, we were able to actually form the proper friendship slash relationship. But I think mm -hmm. so many people will meet somebody, especially other famous YouTubers, or they're like maybe more famous than them or maybe more popular and be like, oh, what could we be? What could we be? And I was like, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if you know them for one moment or 10 years. Right. You ever, do you know who Bobby Lee is? Who does Tiger Belly, the podcast? No. Bobby Lee's in his 50s and the greatest example of insecurity, but I love him. I watch I like every podcast. I love him and Kalila. Mm -hmm. And Bobby Lee will do this thing where he'll be on Joe Rogan. He'll be on other famous comedians' podcasts and be like, I just don't know if they like me. Why doesn't he even invite me to their barbecues? And I'm like, Bobby, because you're fucking, you're self-sabotaging the friendships. You're forcing yeah. them to be more intimate instead of just accepting that, yeah, you're good enough to like 
get on these podcasts or hang out with these people once in a while. But just because you know them, does everyone think every Joe Rogan guest is Joe Rogan's best friend? No, but they if they were the guests, they would hope that Joe Rogan would become their best friend. And that is the delusion. Yes. The delusion is that the connection you have with a person should last a lifetime instead of just being happy. It lasted a moment. Yeah. And that's what even I had to learn, which was like, okay, this is only going to be here for a moment. And that's good enough. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, I just want to be careful with that because like I, I'm in that place now, right? Where like, like when you, when you and I, when you and I DTR and you're like, Hey, I do want to be friends, but I can't be here 2 a.m. And I was like, oh, thank fuck. I don't, I'm, I don't, I don't have space for, my, for 2 a.m. So yeah, yeah, I've yeah. got, I've got my camp kids, um, that I'm their mom and I am always been there 2 a.m. They don't call much, but I will always be there 2 a.m. That's a high burden. There's the mental load of at That's any day huge. they could call me to make sure that I'll call them back. Right. And I've got my closest friends. Mm. I'm full. Yeah. I, I can't take any more 2 a.m.s, which is. I try to be really careful of that because I realize that's a place of privilege. And I've been at the place where I didn't have a single 2 a.m. Yeah. Where I was fucking desperate for even just like an acquaintance who like kind of liked being around me for a while. Um, I was Absolutely. so miserably lonely. So I try to like, I try to hold space with that. Uh, but yeah, I can really understand that. Like I remember when I met Marty as a kid, I wished he, I was like, so my, I like dreamed about him adopting me. Yeah. I knew it would never happen. Yeah. I realized it would never happen. Right. I was, I was fully aware that it was never going to happen, but I was like, wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. And at one point he was hiring like a barn staff member. And I was like, how do I move? I, I know I'm underage. I'm under 18, but how do I move to Southern Alberta and live on his property and become his, uh, barn staff aka his his adoptive child you know um and and for probably from the best benefit for me i didn't i was not able to move you know yeah um i was not willing to take on a minor for that role which was a good choice on his part um so i really really empathize with that i just how it's it's interesting to see how you draw those boundaries and I can understand it. I think I have to figure out what boundaries I draw with it. And I think my main boundary is mostly what I tell people is, hey, I do want to respond to this. If I don't respond within 72 hours, ping me again. I just forgot or I opened it and closed yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't notice it. But also if people start being demanding of my response time, it's a pretty quick way for me to be like to 100. Move, basically not want to talk to you anymore. 100. Um those mentors okay so that teacher that i told you about earlier there was one mm -hmm. time where we were we needed to go from one place by the school to another building and i said can i drive in the car with you and he said absolutely not and i said why not we're cool he goes not only are you an opposite sex student but you're a minor i'm not driving yeah. you in my car and he said if you love me and i know you do because we did we had this a really great relationship he's like you need to honor that love by honoring the boundaries we have in place and it taught me from that moment on that when i love someone I think of their consent. When I love someone, I protect them. When I love someone, I don't put them in situations that could compromise their well-being. Mm. So when I tell my friends, I love you so much, don't take it offensively. If I forget to text you, just like ping me again, just like you do. What I'm asking them to do is consider that every time, and I know, I know, I know, nobody, please, if you're listening to this and you think it's you, I'm talking about hundreds of people who have done this to me, not you, right? I'm talking about that, that moment when you think, and this is, this is going to sound so bad. Even when you think, I'm going to wish Brittany a Merry Christmas, that is one more fucking person I have to give a spoon to that day to message them back. It would be better for my friendship with you if you picked and chosen when you wanted to take a spoon from me. But instead, people don't realize that the, them just saying hi sometimes is now putting a baggage on my shoulder of like, fuck, now I have to respond to somebody. Right. That sounds so awful because like what an honor. But once again, mm -hmm. you're not thinking about me. You're right. thinking about me hanging out with you. Right. But if you just like, and I don't blame them. What an honor to be chosen. But I'm also not your replacement for your loneliness. Right. Because you're objectifying me now and just using me because I'm convenient and nearby. So I also don't like that. So I think the problem I'm having is that Everyone feels like they deserve your time, especially when they pay for you, especially when they're a Patreon, especially when they're, and I try my best, but 
well, hold on. Is this true? <sighs> yeah, I think that the because I'm so mentally ill, but I'm so good at looking like I'm less mentally ill than I am. People don't realize that like kindness for me is space. Actually, one of my mods did that. He's amazing. You know who you are, B. He actually said the greatest thing I realized about Brittany is like the best way to love her is to give her space. Mm. And that's so true. But it's it's and then when I have the spoons, I would love to get coffee with them. I would love to hang out. Mm-hmm. Even if it's just once a year. But the truth, like, ugh, I don't want to say this on the internet. Because, again, I don't want your pity. I want your understanding. I need to file paperwork right now for my doctor. And I can't do it. I just don't have the spoons. Mm. I, don't know why, I don't know why I'm emotional. But, like, okay. I'm on my period, okay? <laughs> but, like, <laughs> but, like, literally, I can't even get myself to a doctor. Because mm. I'm so exhausted. That I I don't know if people understand that every time you go to someone and say, can you hang out with me? You're asking me to not go to the doctor. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So anyways, literally on my period, sorry. (laughs) But like, it's so exhausting. Just being alive for me. I don't know why people like it. (laughs) Like, I like it, but I don't know why people really like it. It's so hard. Paying taxes, existing, waking up every day. I'm like, ugh, again. But at the same time, because I'm joyful, I'm like, oh, yeah, this again. I get to get loved again. I get to hang out with my person again. I get to hang out with Kyla again. Like, there is a real joy there that keeps me going. But my physical body is constantly wanting to die. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like, I'm just getting used to all these new changes. But ultimately, I just don't think people mean to do what they do. I don't think anyone's malicious. I think they're so full of love that they suffocate people with it. Mm-hmm. And that's probably better than the the other side, which is like malicious suffocation. So I'll take yeah. it. Yeah. But it is hurting me. Right? right? That's the part I think of content creation people don't get either. Is like, I love you. I've given you money. I love you. You're the best. Let me suffocate you. And I'm like, I want to die. <laughs> Mm. So again, I don't I I don't want to act like I'm ungrateful. I just want to make it clear that it's confusing. Yeah. And like I think part of what like I think part of what I sometimes I feel bad about especially when we're talking about this is like I feel like I'm sitting at a table full of food and people keep bringing me more food. Yeah. And I'm like give it to somebody else. Yeah. Like, I'm so appreciative. It's so generous. It's so kind of you. But like I'm I'm okay. Like the reality is like, yeah, I need like income and stuff like that. So like that that's my role. But like when it comes to like giving me their time and stuff, I understand mm-hmm. that like part of the doing it is because it's for them and that's a really beautiful thing that I want to like be able to do for you. And at the same time, I'm like, my greatest joy in my entire life is to build a Discord where people find their people. Yeah. And it doesn't like I remember, so we had a community hang uh, hangout where we went to San Diego for TwitchCon. There's like 15 of us there. Not 15, I think 12 actually. It was amazing. And my favorite thing to do wasn't necessarily to be involved. It was to sit back, have no one necessarily talking to me. And I was just watching them all Ugh. love on each other. And yeah. I was like, that made my heart so full because it's like, I appreciate that you want to give to me and I understand why because you feel grateful and you love me and I really fucking appreciate that. I know that I'm in a place of privilege. What can I do to facilitate it so that you are able to find another person to give that to you who can give it back to you as much as you deserve? Because yeah. I, I know I won't be able to and that's not because of you. That's because of me because I'm human and I have limitations. But how can I, like this is what I'm always thinking about with my like online presence is how do I take all of that desire for connection that people have, which is why they're on my Discord, it's why they're messaging me, it's why they're talking, and how do I redirect it at each other Yeah. so that I can sit back like a proud uh, mom or like whatever archetype I'm going to get. Nick always calls me the empress. Yes. Whatever it is, <laughs> I, I'm not really ready to own that one yet. Because yeah. I'm like, I'm like, top dollar hustle grind, baby, which is like not, not what's going on for me. But I want to like sit back yeah. like an old grandma and just be like proud. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. We just had this conversation on my VC where yeah. there was like um, 
I want to know they are making other discords and hanging out. I want them to go play games with each other. I want them like right now. And y'all know who you are. They're all trying to get me to play a fucking game. And I don't know how to explain to them that like it's like asking your mom to come play video games with you and your friends. I want you guys to do it together. But asking me to do it is like it's too hard of a game for me. I'm going to get exhausted. You asked me to play a game with you. And did I reject you, Kyla? Please tell my audience I also reject my YouTube friends. Mm Mm-hmm. I, if it's a game I can't play, I just can't play it. Yeah. So I, I want to know you're all playing it together. I want to know they're doing their own thing together. I do not want them to feel like I need to be there for it to be good. Mm-hmm. Right? Like I want them to eventually get married and have kids and move on and not be on my Discord. And I hope when they're 90, they're doing other things. And I, I will always have to be here because this is who I've decided to be. And I Mm -hmm. always shuffle in new people who are having existential dread and asking themselves, like, why am I here, Brittany? And again, I'll do this every year and answer the same questions for the rest of my life. Because that's the person I've decided to be. I did not decide Mm -hmm. to be the person who stops answering the same questions of what is the self? What is free will? I never get to stop answering that because that, again, that's the responsibility I've taken on. So I'm asking my audience to eventually grow past me. So I can facilitate this joy for somebody else, a different group of people. They can't keep me for themselves, even if it feels like that's what they want to do. And I do get very personal with my callers. I do get very personal with my Discord because I think they're people. They're not just like random usernames to me as much as I try not to make them be. Obviously, there's a lot of them. So depending on how often you're there, I might forget you exist. (laughs) But that's the thing is like in order for me to keep doing this job, there has to be enough of me to go around. Actually, what is that story Hmm, where like, oh, what is it where they want something so badly so they all take a piece and then there's nothing left and they've destroyed the thing and now they've like, it's like they, the toxic side of this job is your audience could eat you. Mm. You'll burn out and you'll never come back to the internet because they've all tried Mm. to take a piece of you. But if they all give you enough space, your content creators, your favorite ones really can exist on the space for a long time. Hmm. But the audience needs to be just as responsible for caring for the mental health of how they interact with their their people. You know what I mean? And then that way, when I get the real crazies, I can just ignore them. But what pains me the most is when I get a really good person and I've had so many good people who look at me and say, you're not who I thought you were because you won't be closer to me. And all I'm thinking is like, you're better than this, demanding past my consent that I should be closer to you. So figure it out. Because you're really hurting people, not just me, you know? But boundaries are kind of key. I think I'm open, but I have boundaries. Say it again. I'm open, but I have boundaries. Yeah. 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 Did I did I tell you the new boundary that I came across the other, like last week that I'm going to start implementing? Say that, it. Like, uh, so I basically decided that if somebody doesn't know me well at all, they don't get to psychoanalyze and project me. And if they start talking to me where they're telling me what I am or what I'm thinking, mm. or what I'm feeling, especially if after I tell you you're wrong, you just keep believing it and trying to convince me anyways, I'm not interested at all. I won't be talking to you anymore. Mm. Um, like if you stop talking like that, I'll still talk to you, obviously. Mm-hmm. But it's like if you're going down that dialogue tree, I'm not even kind of interested. It's over. We're not talking anymore. Because I think when yeah. I was trying to figure out like what's been stressing me out the most and making me the most bitter, it's been people – because all I want to do is be seen when people are attempting to see me and they're so fucking wrong Ugh. and they also won't course correct. I can't. It kills it me. Make, mm-hmm. It makes me, it makes me hate them. And I don't want to be a hateful person. And I think hatred's on me. And so it's like, if that's on me, my responsibility is to give you the heads up beforehand that if you do this, it, it, I will, I will stop talking to you about this thing. Like it's over. The conversation is over. I can't do it. Um, if I let you continue to do it, I will be allowing myself to be like hateful towards you and I can't do it. Uh, but you have no place. You have no place to be saying these things about me. Um, Does it feel like gaslighting? Um, sometimes. I think at first it was a little gaslighty. The, I'm just, I'm so blessed, Brittany. I know you love your partner. I love Nick. He's amazing. Um, I don't know. I don't know how I left out with this man. He is yeah. just, yeah, he's just a cat's meow for sure. Um, <laughs> So I'm really lucky in that, like, I think he sees me better than I see me because this is part of my problem. Mm. People don't see me my whole life. I didn't see me either. Like, I didn't know who I was. And so I'm really lucky that, like, I think Nick has seen me better than I have seen me a lot of the time. Um, 
because I'm always so willing to like flex myself and morph myself to like meet other people's needs because I really, really like hurting meeting people's needs, not hurting. Sorry. Yeah. I, really I was like, people. um, excuse me. It's <laughs> <laughs> the red lights. Yes. Um, no. And so I've found that I'm blessed in that like it is a little gaslighty, but then I can go to Nick and be like, is this, do you think that this is true? Totally. And he's like, no. And he can list like six reasons immediately why it's not true. Yeah. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay, fuck. Okay. Um, so yeah. But now that I know that it's not true, now I hate you for doing it. Mm. And so I, I need to take the responsibility of saying, I'm not going to let people do this to me. If it makes me like that hateful, if it like triggers me that much, it's my responsibility to make sure people know that like, this is a boundary that can't, that yeah. I, I can't be crossed. I, I can't. That, oh, okay. That's somebody said this in VC to me today that, um, I do put a lot of the responsibility on myself and I was like, well, it's my brain and my body. So like I have to, right. And I fully would love a world where everyone else did the same. But it doesn't always work out that way. So I will say, like, I'm open and I have boundaries and they have to be really strict, like you said, because I cannot risk my mental health going down the tubes again Um, because it will destroy all the work I've done and all the people who depend on me won't have anyone to depend on. Yeah. And that really feels shitty. First. Yeah. Like, it has to be. So I have this thing where, like, it's hard, though, because uh, Borderline is really like a, I call it like a major identity crisis. Or like I tried to be a lot of Britneys throughout the years. By the way, how you how you doing with spoons, girl? I'm good. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I uh like recently, like last year or sometime, my mom gets on this thing where like in my family, my inbred incest family, God bless us, all the Middle East is just first cousins and they all marry each other and give us all like beautiful, <laughs> That's true. beautiful That's genetics true. and horrible brains. Um, everyone's mentally ill, period. And my mom thinks everyone gets molested. That's just like what she thinks because that's like, you know, that's basically what happened to everyone she knows. Right. And so my mom does this thing and it fucks with me where last year we were sitting on the couch and this is prior to me having my partner and everything and, you know, we're all just talking about life. And my mom goes, um, I mentioned something about being queer and she goes, Betsy, were you molested? I was like, oh, who? Why are you asking me this question like every fucking time? Do you know something I don't know? Do you know something I don't know? Because mm -hmm. I don't have any memory of being molested. So you better tell me right now. Because I know we have like molesters in this family. So who was it? And my mom goes, I don't know this. You know this. Is this why you're gay? And I was like, and I'm sitting there and we're having this conversation for the hundredth billion time. Literally. There's three queer kids out of the 10 my mom had. Yeah. I remember you saying okay. that. And I'm just like, for, and I'm doing this thing and I'm like, Are, do you know something I don't know? She goes, because she, my mom always says, I know you better than you know yourself. So my head starts spiraling and I'm like, was I molested? And all of a sudden I'm like, I'm like, oh my, and I'm looking at her and she goes, no, I promise you, no. But were you? And I'm like, so then I feel like I'm being gaslit because I'm being like told, like that's what she wants the answer to be. She doesn't right. want it to be that I'm just naturally queer. She doesn't want it to be anything other than something bad happened. And right. that's why, right? That's so then finally I disassociate and I'm gone. And my sister and brother go, oh, she's gone. And my dad goes, stop. She said she wasn't, drop it, okay? Like Brittany says she wasn't molested, she wasn't molested. And here's a conversation, all my siblings are just watching me and my sister's like, well, she's disassociated now, so, you, like she's not even here. And I'm, you know, when I'm disassociated, I can hear everything, I'm not freaking that out of it. But I just like, mm -hmm. I don't feel anything anymore. So like I went to the bathroom and I got myself through it and I was like, Brittany, this is what, and I split my brain into like multiple Britneys to do this, right? I think I've told, maybe I've told you this, but I had to basically tell myself like, you are disassociated. That is okay. Your mom's being shitty. Breathe. She thinks you've been hurt. You haven't. She's never going to concede on this. She's never going to concede. Even recently, as of Christmas a week ago, my brother's gay <laughs> and I have a priest friend who comes over to hang out with me. He's like my age. And I was like, oh, the priest, priest was over. My mom goes, oh, did Mark hang out with the priest? And I go, no, mom's not, Mark's not a fan of priests. Mama goes, was he molested? And I was like, Again, not everything is molestation, okay? Right. He just doesn't want to be around a person who's Catholic because it's kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> but I'm bisexual, so half of me isn't uncomfortable, <laughs> okay? And, like, <laughs> that's what – but, again, my mom comes from, like, the best place possible. She sees so much of me. Sometimes I go to my mom for advice. Her advice is so fucking good. Mm. It is so perfectly because she sees me so great, but because she can't see my sexuality – she cannot see this. She cannot actually logic her way through a good answer. Right. And so instead of hating my mom, I put a boundary on my mother. 
I love you. I'm coming home for Christmas for two days. And then I'm going home on the third, period. Mm -hmm. Even though traditionally I came home for a week, but what I noticed was if I spend four days with my mom, I get triggered. Mm. And then I trigger her because I think yeah. my mom has undiagnosed borderline, but I don't know that. Talk about abandonment. She got major abandonment in her history. Mm. So my parents did better than their parents. My parents are actually letting me choose a love marriage while their parents wanted them to get arranged. And my mom was. Right. Mm. I get to do so much more. My brother's gay and he gets to come home for Christmas. That wasn't a thing that happened. In Iraq, the only gay people they knew were were pedophiles. Right. So right. you can understand, like, so much of being an adult to me is having the kindness, maturity, consideration, and patience for people and meeting them where they are, but also through this process, like, always humanizing yourself. Again, mm -hmm. so you can humanize them. How can my mother love me and see me if I don't even – bother seeing her if I hate her so much there was a time in my life 2012 I moved to Seattle and I used to pray that my parents would die mm. so I wouldn't have to want them so badly mm. I wanted to be loved by them so badly it would have been better for them to have died so I could say well they died I can't have it right but instead I got therapy and I came home and I told my parents I'm gonna put boundaries down and by the way it was hard so when I yep. first did it after dbt my mom and I were sewing. We were in her front yard and my mom was nagging at me, like saying things like, you know, like just things. And I'm like, mom, I love you. Is it OK if we talk about something else? No, I want to talk about this. Mom, I love you. It's really hurting my feelings. Well, why? You say you're a strong feminist. So have the conversation. I am a strong feminist. But in this moment, I feel a little fragile. Well, if you're so fragile, maybe you're not a strong feminist. And I was like, Sounds like we're not getting anywhere. I love you so much. And I can tell my mom's getting triggered. So it's not just right. me. My mom's not a narcissist. My mom is a, like a person who is is so worried I'm going to go to hell. She loops. Right. So I told my mom, I love you. I'm going. And as I walk to my car, she follows me. Well, why do you need space? I don't understand. Like, we've never needed space before. I know. Because I didn't know how to make it. Right. right. So then I got into my car and I left and I cried my way home. And then I came back the next day because I was supposed to for 4th of July. My mom goes, oh, you showed up. And I go, yeah, I told you I'd be here. I love you. And she goes, but we had a fight yesterday. And normally we don't talk for a few days after. And I said, yeah, but I've gone to therapy and I'm going to try something different this time around. And she goes, OK. And now years later, my mom is so much better at respecting our boundaries. So right. much better. But she's not going to go to therapy herself. So I have to be the one to give her the tools. Yeah. So I made that decision. Nobody else has to make that decision Brittany made. But if you find yourself in a similar situation and you know your parents are good people at their core, they're just a little weird. I think there's a path that isn't in any textbook. And I, I think it's the path of like kindness. And that doesn't it's not exactly written about in a way that's consumable by all people. Sometimes people have to see yeah. it being done. I, yeah, I think that's really that's a really important thing that you talk about with your mom, because like. I think the problem that a lot of people have is they're so binary, right? So they're like, well, my mom's hurting me. So I have to have them not in my life. And the right. reality is like, sometimes the boundary you need with somebody is to not have them in your life, right? Yes, totally. I, I, I have that boundary with some people that like, I don't know if I would say that they're friends because they're obviously can't be in my life. But the reality is if they came to me and they were like, hey, you know, my husband's been kidnapped and in prison and I need help. Some, some, some extreme situation where for whatever reason, I'm the only person that can help them. Of course I would help them. Yeah, of course I would. Right. <clears throat> uh, but I can't, I can't have them in my life. Totally. And I think it's really important that like your whole life story in many ways is about like seeing yourself with a margin of error and therefore seeing others with a margin of error and then figuring out between each other's spaces what what is manageable and what is unmanageable right and so like one of the lines that's manageable is i can be in relationship with you that's okay <clears throat> a line that's not manageable for me is we're not going to be like super close on a number of things we're totally. not going to talk about x and x things because we just can't but i love you i'm willing to be here for you i want you in my life yeah and i think that that's a really big thing that people miss now in relationships i don't think most people know how to do this like it's so counter to everything that we know Whereas it's like, if, if I can't have everything with them, then they can't be in my life. And yeah. it's like, that's not necessarily true. However, there are some people that can't be in your life and that's okay. For sure. Just make sure that when you're making that decision, that's why I say, when you're thinking about what your boundaries need to be, make sure they matter. 
because a boundary is a big ask of the other person. It yes. is inherently a rejection. You are saying, can I reject you in this way indefinitely? And can you be okay with that? That's a big fucking ask. So it's like, don't just make arbitrary boundaries. Make sure that they matter, but make sure that the boundaries you set will allow you to exist within that relationship and give you both meaning and and, and like joy. And I don't think many people realize that like, what relationships can look like mm. can vary across the board and they can be very boundary. Like yeah. we now have a boundary rule in our family for Christmas because our family Christmases are always awful as well. They're terrible. So this year, uh, like Nick and I have decided that we don't stay at our parents' house at my parents' house for Christmas anymore. Um, so we have Christmas at my brother's house, which is great. And another boundary that we have is it's like a soft boundary of essentially Bryce, uh, my brother Bryce has decided I am going to Organize events so that we have activities that we're doing. We're not just going to sit around okay. so that our <clears throat> emotions and moods can fester. So we're going to have a bunch of arbitrary traditions that I'm just going to make up that we're going to do every year. We're going to try them. We're going to try different ones out to see what works. And we're going to have things to do yes. so that we're not just stuck talking about our relational problems. Because it's like with me and my mom, for example, she's never going to see me. She's never going to see me, at mm. least not as she is. She might in the future. Cause like my parents, I think are much more open to change than I think some mm. people's parents are because my dad changed a ton. Yeah. So maybe in the future, but as my mom is now, she's never going to see me never, ever, ever, ever. And we have to figure out like boundaries and whatnot to work, to make a relationship work, or then we can't have a relationship. And yeah. So I'm still in the process. I haven't fully negotiated with my mom, like what that looks like, because she's not super happy with some of the boundaries I would like to have, but yeah. 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 Well, you know, I have like a one in my inner circle that I really love, yeah. but we have a very strong distance makes the heart grow fonder relationship and it has to stay in place. Like he knows he's not allowed to show up to my house unannounced because it feels like a threat when he does it. But mm -hmm. my other inner circle people, they can show up without a warning. I'm like, oh, hey, what's up, bro? Why are you here? Cool. Like, come on over, I guess. But he mm -hmm. can't. Because he formed such a friendship and a relationship with the people in his life that made even something that is innocent feel like a threat because right. he can be sometimes. And it's one of those things where I love him. I never want the mob to go after him. I don't want the world to judge him. They don't know him like I know him. They don't get to see him when he is at his best. And since mm -hmm. I've seen him at his best, I know that even though he's 90% in his worst, he has a best. And that's the person that I'm hoping he eventually lands on and decides to be. But until he decides to be that person, we have to have distance. Yeah. And that sucks. It does suck. It sucks. And there's no rhyme or reason to it. You just pick people. Yeah. 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 I don't know why. Like, I get, like, I'll have, like, two people, let's say, in my life who are, like, the same by description. Women, sex workers, tattoos, bisexual, like, cool, progressive – but for some reason, I lean towards one more than the other. Right. And the question is why? Well, I think those eight parts of my core self that I really, really honor, I think someone sees more than the other. And even though we have things in common, like we both love cake. Oh, my gosh. That's not enough to build a friendship. Right. right. But it's not a rejection of the person. It's saying, I think you're made to be with someone who's even going to honor your friendship more than I ever can. That symbiotic relationship we're all actually looking for, which is why people like me feel alone in a room full of people. That's yeah. not enough. Yeah. You need to find people who are truly going to give you that relationship that you need. Because mm. that's going to facilitate your joy a lot better than superficial relationships that everyone is currently struggling with. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. <sighs> Damn. Yeah, I was surprised coming into the streamer world to see how bad is that relationship. Because I went from the Christian land to secular world, and ah. I was actually kind of shocked because Christians are not good people in a lot of ways, but they're pretty good at relationship. Like, they actually get yeah. a lot of these things. Like, I think most religious people tend to. I could be wrong, but that's been my experience is that, like, religious people kind of get some of these, like, foundationals for relationship. I was shocked when I went into just, like, a secular world, and I was like, you guys suck at relationship. Yeah. Like, like the deepest conversation they've ever had in their life with me was like a Tuesday for me, but not just because I'm special. It's a Tuesday for like most of the people in my life. Like we just have yeah. deeper conversations sometimes with people. Yep. Um, I, I feel like now that I'm in the streamer world, I'm like, 
oh gosh, these secular people were fucking G's at relationship compared to you motherfuckers. Like you don't even kind of know. Not not, not all. I'm sure there's there you know like there's you and there's yeah. other people, but. Wow, I've been. Uh, that was not. Uh, that was not what I was expecting coming into this space. I thought that they would be actually better at understanding the transientness of relationships sometimes, and being okay that like sometimes we're friends for a season and not later, right. and like just the way that dynamic relationships change over time. And I was very wrong about that. <laughs> I will say one thing that you made me think of. My, I just connected with my older brother came he lives in houston and he came over to cali and we we're all there and it was really great i only get to catch up with him during christmas like that's the only time we get to see each other and yeah. he's wonderful and he's super catholic he left the church for a while but came back and he was telling me because i was like man you seem really joyful bro and he was like yeah honestly i had a realization a few years ago and it really changed my life and it was that i needed catholic friends and i was like tell me about it he said well I was feeling torn with my secular friends. Like I was feeling like I had to fake who I was when I was with them. Not because they were anti-religious, but because the way that they spoke about women or the way they did certain things made me feel like I wasn't serving God to the best of my ability. So mm. now he only has Catholic friends. He runs a Catholic sports group. He goes to Catholic church. He has Catholic, like the only place he has secular friends and they're not even friends is at work. He has coworkers. But right. he really is a social extrovert who does everything Catholic. He dates on CatholicMatch.com. <laughs> he only dates certain people. And one of the ways we talked about dating, I said, oh, it's easier for you than the secularists, huh? Because you guys skip straight to Catholic values going to be basically in line. Because right. we were going through his red flags. He's like, I don't really have red flags when I'm dating. I was like, we'll find one. Hold on. And I was like, well, what if she tied her tubes in her 20s? He's like, if she was Catholic, why would she do that? And I was like, oh what if and like we were going through back and forth like what could be the red flag during dating like mine is you believe in god that's a little too far from my reality we're done his is right. you don't believe in god but he's on catholicmatch.com so why would they be there if they're not already right. catholic so mm. we talked about it and i thought about it it's not that you need to or that he needed to reject his secular friends he needed to let them go so they could also find people who would best serve them mm. and again when we really care about someone when we're really suffering with them compassion, we want the best for them, not just the best for us. Right. And so he wasn't rejecting them like, you're gross, you're not Catholic. It was more like, bro, you'd be so much happier with a friend that can meet you, talk to you, see you, not be uncomfortable around you. Even him and I, though we're in our circle for each other, we'll be there night, night and day. We're not what I would call friends. Like, I don't confide in my brother. He doesn't really confide in me. I, he doesn't want to hear about my BDSM or my YouTube life, really. He doesn't want to hear about my sex life. Like, he just really doesn't want to. But that yeah. doesn't mean that I wouldn't be there for him. It doesn't mean he doesn't love me. It just means, like, our mm -hmm. relationship is what it should be. And that's what it is. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people, again, rejection should be about consent, not about I'm not worthy. It should be about, well, what does this person need? And if I'm not what they need but I want to be, maybe I'm open to changing. But even changing doesn't guarantee that person will come back into your life. But maybe what you're really looking for is not that particular person, but the trope of that person. Let's say you want like more sober friends. Well, it's not going to be the only like there are millions of sober people in the world. Right. Like yeah. I always tell people there are eight billion people on this planet that are probably awesome. Six billion, seven billion, a hundred billion, a hundred million, whatever. I can't be friends with all of you. Right. Do you even like, can we do that? So why would we continue torturing your, each other even more by forcing those friendships to occur? Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So again, yeah. I think it's always about consent, always about consideration, always about compassion. How do I best serve this person that I've just met? Like, I'm really conscientious of like, which YouTubers, because I know they're busy. Like, who do I send a DM to? If I think of them, should I even message them? Only because I'm thinking the same thing for myself too. Right. Like, even when I get a DM from a YouTuber, I'm like, oh, that's so nice. They're like kind of tentatively opening the door to allowing me more space in their life. But I still don't want to take advantage of my new friends. Right. And that's like the line we're always playing with. But that's why I just go to, can we negotiate, bros? So I don't have to think. So I don't have to figure it out. You yes. So I don't have to fucking think, oh, my God, they hate me. They're not texting me back. Versus, oh, yeah, that's blah, blah, blah. They just don't text. Chill. They'll yeah. get back to me in like a three months. No biggie. Because they're not in a circle. But if my sister waited three months to get back to me, girl, I would drive to California, pull her by her hair and be like, how dare you wait three months for a reply? How dare you make me wait? Because like right. you're in a circle, you have different obligations. Right. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. You know. Mm -hmm. How's your spoons? 
mine are mine are low for some reason not sure why well i mean i feel like we've talked about a lot um i'm feeling pretty good i'll talk to my chat for a little while before i actually like log off log off but it's what time is it uh 8 41 pacific uh i'm usually like getting ready for bed about now so i'm gonna finish doing my laundry like i had to tell my vc like my spoons are so low girl i did do dishes yesterday so i could do laundry today like, I have to think about it so, like, carefully. Like, okay, Brittany, we're streaming today. We're doing an event on Discord and laundry. One chore. Which chore do we want to do today? I've been wanting to do laundry for, like, three weeks. <laughs> and I'm like, it has been, like, three weeks of me going, are we going to do it today? Nope, not today. Okay, we'll do something else. Is this today? Yeah. Nope, something else, something easier. Next week, wish me luck, I'm going to vacuum the staircase. Why they put carpet on stairs, I will never know. <laughs> It's the worst. It's the worst. It is the worst. worst. The whole, you have to hold the whole. You just, it's the worst. So, and especially with my like, anyways. So next week, wish me luck. I will vacuum the stairs. Hey, I appreciate that you take care of yourself like you're somebody that you're accountable for. You're responsible for. I appreciate That's that, cool. girly. I appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Is there anything else we should talk about? I saw a couple super chats on my end. So I definitely want to uh, maybe uh, actually. I'll play my alerts. I haven't heard any of them. I paused all of them. So I didn't get distracted. It, what do you think about this comment from punk rock thank you so much girly it says Brittany, how do you forgive someone who didn't ask who didn't ask to be forgiven yeah i don't think you forgive people for other people almost at all i i, I agree it's about the other person asking i agree i think it's about you letting yourself go basically yeah i think sometimes forgiveness is like um the other side of harboring and hoarding and i think like letting it go is mm -hmm. probably the best way to give yourself a sense of peace, but also give that person an opportunity um, to be someone different mm -hmm, mm -hmm, without mm -hmm. expecting them to be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how much the other person is a part of that conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's what I learned too in my borderline DBT. She said, even though you were manic and hurt, and even though they hurt you, you need to go apologize to everyone you hurt when you were triggered and everyone you hurt because you were sick. And I was like, but I was sick. And she goes, doesn't matter. And I was like, fuck. And that's hard because I wasn't allowed to ask for forgiveness. I was there to apologize for what I did and right. not to assume that says, since I said sorry, that they would go, I'm also sorry. But just to accept that they would, like, my job was just to do my thing. Yeah. That was hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I, uh, Destiny hates apologies and so does Nick. Um, it's like saying I, them I or getting why. them getting them ah. um which i understand mostly because they've been apologized i think both of them i know nick has returned i think destiny has too they said the same thing they've been apologized so many times by people who will apologize and turn around and do it right again that for they, sure they I, they don't want to hear it it's just interesting because for me <sighs> when i apologize to somebody it's not really about you it's mm. about me being like i i wronged you and i want to make sure that i am fully holding all of the weight of the responsibility of the size of your hurt. And I think part of that is allowing myself to like be in the awkward position of being like, Hey, I'm really sorry. Um, but I agree. A lot of people, I guess do, but, 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 sorry, this is, empty, but. but this is so important. Steven and Nick's have to keep doing what they're doing because the truth is, is like their life gave them the tools to realize this happens. But mm -hmm. also like, I think because it's not a, they, I don't want someone to accept my apology until they're ready or if at all. Right. Because it's important for my growth to understand that when you fuck up, you fucked up. Right. Like, it's really important for my brain just because, like, again, I live in a family that, like, we really see each other in our ugliest moments. And then somehow we still end up together on Christmas and we get better every year. Slow but steady. Right. There's like yeah. 12 of us. So it's like everyone's at a different healing journey of them. Like my mom recently was like oh, you boys, um, you guys should all get like a place together. And I looked at my mom. I was like, these two can't live together. They fight. And she goes, oh, well, maybe they living together will help. I was like, no, they physically fight. This one gets triggered and this one triggers this one. And then they fight. They fought in my house when they were visiting. Just like, no, you guys need way more time to heal before you can be in the same space. It's not. And mm -hmm. they, they both said, they're like, no, we're brothers. We'll get over it. I'm like, hey, you don't have to prove anything to anyone. You don't have to play the game of we're brothers, so we'll get along. You should play mm -hmm. the game of we're brothers, so we're going to give each other space. Yeah. But people feel like, well, if you have a real love for your family, you won't fight. If you mm -hmm. really love your family, you won't, you, won't, you won't cross these boundaries. But sometimes, mental health, we cross those boundaries. Right. You know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. 
Is there anything yeah. on your end you want to read or anything else you want to cover? I'm not sure. I haven't been playing them. Okay, no pressure, no pressure, no pressure, no pressure. I think there's just the one. There was just a Happy New Year wish, so I think we're good to That's go so sweet. on this end. There yeah. we go. The trick I found with Nick, and I, I'm curious if it would work with Destiny, is when I want to apologize to him, the way I can do so best so that I'm also owning up for the hurt that I think I did to him is to thank him instead. Ah. So rather than saying, because like, I'm a decently broken person, so I'm like, oh, I was being like, I'm, rather than saying like, I'm really sorry I was being unfair to you, I saying, thank you so much for being patient with me. I know that I'm fair to you, unfair yeah. to you a lot because of my stuff. It is my stuff. I really appreciate that you love me anyways. And yeah. that to him means the world. Yeah, so, I think that's so good. Everyone. That is yeah. so good. That is absolutely, that is wonderful. Especially for the person I think, I think the difference is you should apologize to people who you hurt enough that they cut you out, mm. right? And they don't want to see you. But if they're still there, I think a thank you is better. Gratitude is so because, important. Yeah. 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 Because like when you hurt someone, it almost feels like, like I, I have this thing where I just don't want to feel like I'm being taken advantage of because I'm so willing to go places for people. Like, please don't take, again, love me enough not to take advantage of me, please. Mm-hmm. But it's so hard. Like people just, boundaries are so hard. But that's okay. Be patient with yourself. Be patient with others. It's like a thing. It's a tool you have to learn. I think I get better and better at it every year. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for talking to me. Yeah, girly. Thanks for inviting me on. I'm so glad. I'm so glad you, nobody has any idea how long this took. (laughs) You were so busy. And I don't stream enough, but you were so busy. And I love yeah. it so much. And I'm so glad we could do it. And I do want to, I, I want to be more accessible to you guys at night when I have the spoons. Because I know a lot mm-hmm. of you guys stream at night. So I hope in the future I can continue to be available. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't mind adjusting my schedule to be on earlier for you as well. So <sighs> that's, that. I appreciate that a lot. Yeah. All right, girly. Have a good night. Tell Nick I said hi. Okay, I will. Okay, bye. <laughs> My head in real life while I'm bed My belly's being fed and I'm okay I'm just fine, yet all I do is whine Not to you in my mind, cause I know I don't make sense I've been nothing but blessed So why's my life a mess? Please tell me, cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah Sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool